everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this very special Yasmin Muhammad podcast episode. It is, of course, very special because we have the one, the only Samuel Benjamin Harris with us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam, for joining me here. Oh, it's great to see you, Yas. Very happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so you know that I am really, really grateful to you and for all the work that you're doing for being honest, for having integrity. I'm getting messages all the time of people thanking me for having you on this podcast. Um, they're saying that, that, you know, you're the voice of reason, you're the adult in the room, you're making a lot of people just feel sane in a world that seems to have gone insane. Um, and I'd like to say specifically for ex-Muslims, you know, because you have always mm. been I mean, right now, obviously, for the Jewish community after October 7th, there's been a lot of uh, hate coming in their direction, a lot of, um, you know, just like confusing things going on in the world that we'll get to talk about in a moment. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk more, you know, specifically about ex-Muslims and how, you know, we are a particularly sharp thorn um, in the side of apologists that can't quite respond honestly to like, who we are and why we should be killed by the, the, you know, the, why Islam teaches that. And so they pretend that we don't exist um, and they deflect Islamophobia, yeah. deflect to feigning Islamophobia. Um, you and I, you know, I met you through the famous interaction you had with Ben Affleck on the, uh, on the Bill Maher show. And of course it feels like you've been having that conversation over and over and over again. I've, listened to your conversation with Rory Stewart and it was really, really familiar. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So, all too familiar. Painfully so. All too familiar. I just felt yeah. for you, you know, it was, it was frustrating for me just being a listener, but I'm wondering if you feel that, you know, from Ben to Rory, do you think in general, because of October 7th, I'd say, do you think in general things might have improved, changed, remained stagnant, or do you think October 7th, has forced people to open their minds. How are you feeling about just the trajectory of things? Um, well, it's, it's hard to take the temperature of it. I really, I don't know. I mean, th things seem worse to me. Um, I mean, the moral the moral confusion seems worse. I mean, if October, uh, October 7th, the, the atrocities were so, uh, you know, specifically abhorrent and so undeniable right that i just think that and and they were denied immediately right and the yeah. the side of hamas was taken immediately even before israel had responded so the the moral confusion seems to me to be about as bad as it could possibly be um and rhetorically i feel that many of us are in a, at a disadvantage you know specifically someone like myself it is jews who for whom the 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 clash of civilizations has has long been a concern. We're at a disadvantage because we're, we're it's easily framed as a a a symptom of of our tribal solidarity to be taking the side of Israel in this particular conflict, right? Because as I think you know, my concern about Islam has had very little to do with Israel or Judaism. You know, it's just I mean, I, it's it's really been an afterthought for me. All the way up until October seventh, right? I mean, I'm just not. I have not, you know, I, you know, I've not thought about anti-Semitism very much in my life, um, and my concern about Islam and you know, Islamism and jihadism has been um, much more. It's, um, it, you know, it's it's zero sum conflict with the West, with with Western values, with open societies, uh, and you know, I've been you know even you know I've been even more focused on moderate Muslims, you know, wherever they can be found and, and ex-Muslims more than Jews up until October 7th, right? So I, I'm very uncomfortable in a conversation where it continually gets spun back to, you know, you're a, a mere defense of Israel and a mere concern about anti-Semitism, right? I mean, we can we can do do more to tease those strands apart in this conversation, I think, but because I think anti-Semitism, you, know, you now is a is a real concern in a way that you know per perhaps it has always been, but I have just lost sight of it. But my concern about Islamism and jihadism and the the excesses of you know conservative, albeit mainstream Islam, 
are um, run much deeper and have nothing in principle to do with with um, anti-Semitism, apart from the fact that anti-Semitism anti is one form of intolerance one finds within Islam. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that denial that you were mentioning, today is International Women's Day. So, you know, we have to talk about how Judith Butler, who is a darling of the progressive left, um, yeah. who and actually- such a good writer. Such a clear, <laughs> such a clear writer. <laughs> such a clear thinker. <laughs> yeah. Remarkable. Um, yeah. Prose. Uh, and she, she recently, if, if people you know, don't know what people might not know what I'm referring to, but she is famously the uh, the most muddled writer in the English language. I mean, she you can read paragraphs of her, and it's just synonymous with brain damage. You know, every sentence is is uh, is doing you harm. And yet she is so popular. You know, she is as popular in the universities today as Noam Chomsky was in my day. Like she is the, mm -hmm. you know, intellectual powerhouse in our universities across North America. So that's that's a really sad state of affairs. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about how she, obviously she called Hezbollah and Hamas part of the the left in the past, she called them part of the progressive left, which in and of itself is exactly what you describe with the muddled thinking. But to add, you know, insult to injury, she talked about how what happened on October 7th. So these women being kidnapped, tortured and raped, elderly children, babies being kidnapped. She said that these were not acts of terrorism. She believes that they're not acts of terrorism. She said that they are just acts of resistance. Someone like her, I believe, has a has a severely broken moral compass to say such things. And it is such a psychosis, but it's not even like it's just her. She's so dangerous because she has such a platform, you know, her her voice is is listened to in the humanities across universities and i'm what can we do about that how can we reach people that are so indoctrinated to that degree that they would clap in response and that they would be sharing this video as proof that look our you know our godmother of gender queer theory the person that we all look up to these days, look what she said. She said that the rape of these women is an act of resistance and not an act of terrorism. How do you talk to those people? How do you reach them? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can only hope that many people who are in that camp aren't actually tracking the details, right? So they, they don't know what they're signing up for. Analogous to the people who are chanting from the river to the sea, they don't actually understand the genocidal implications of a phrase like that and it just sounded good so I, I think there i think we just have to acknowledge just as it is with islam there are gradations to people's belief there's gradations to you know each piece of the ideology that a, that a person has signed on to consciously there's a there are gradations to just how knowledgeable someone is about what you know, specific words and sentences mean. I mean, so so if if someone says in response to a a questionnaire in the UK that they want to live under Sharia law, you know, do do they really know what they they mean when they say yes to that? Right. I mean, some some clearly do, but I I'm, I'm willing to discount that there's a a penumbra that surrounds you know the 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 real people of interest there of you know where there's people who just are, are confused or just saying what sounds good or just you know, just they're they're bullshitting on some level and it's it's not you know there's there's some there's some margin of of skepticism i think that's appropriate there so a lot of these college students and and um you know the leftists who seem for all intents and purposes to be hamas supporters i think mm -hmm. if if they were really forced to confront the the, the specifics, um, might in fact you know pull back from the brink and and realize that they were you know, they didn't mean what they they thought they meant. But um, you know, apart from that, you know, it's it's a totally sociopathic skewing 
of uh, of our politics, right? It's just insane to 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 um, agree to any of that. And I thought Doug, Douglas Murray had a really nice line. I, I assume it originates with him. I have parroted it. Uh, what, on this issue of proportionality, when people have complained about the the Israelis, you know, responding disproportionately to the the violence of October seventh, uh, as measured by body count, which is obviously the wrong way to measure it, but um, Douglas said, okay, well, you know, clearly what was needed was a, a truly proportionate response, which is to say that the the IDF should have gone in into Gaza and found a music festival. And raped and and tortured and murdered the precise number of teenagers and young men and women peacefully dancing there. And then they should have, you know, found the precise number of families and tied them together and burned them alive and et cetera, et cetera. Raped the same number of people. Uh, you know, who thinks that would have been the the um, an ethically wise and and uh, acceptable response to the atrocities of October seventh? No one. I mean, that would just be, you know, to have reduced the IDF to the barbarism uh, shown by Hamas. Um, but, but just counting bodies is not the way you 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 reconcile uh, the, the seeming moral disparities on either side of a conflict like this. And people are really confused about that. And, and you know, certainly fans of Noam Chomsky would be confused about that because that's what he tends to do. Um, the fact that, the, you know, it's, it's hard to know what the numbers are because because that we get we get numbers from Hamas, but you know, I, let's just stipulate that the IDF has killed more Palestinians than than Palestinians killed in Israel on October seventh. At this point, um, uh, the those deaths are uh, the you know the, the causal sequence. You have to understand that that accounts for those deaths starts with. Hamas using its non-combatants as human shields, right? There was a ceasefire on October 6th. Hamas broke it and has strategically used non-combatants ever since as human shields, uh, doing whatever it could to ensure the maximum number of casualties on its own side, right? So that that that, that cynical use of, of civilians in war um, is the... The, kind of the, the morally culpable layer that has to be of this conflict that has to be focused on. And everyone just skips over that. And everyone call, you know anyone calling for a ceasefire, it's understandable seeing all of the destruction and and death in Gaza that uh, well-intentioned people in the West might want to call for a ceasefire at this point. I totally understand that. And what's happening in Gaza is an absolute catastrophe. But any call for a ceasefire has to start with the sentences that acknowledge the hostages taken by Hamas, and it has to call for a release of those hostages as the the proximate cause of any ceasefire, right? Um, the release of those hostages in full, right? And if not the 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 actual surrender of Hamas, right? I mean that was that's that's the only way to actually start that process, and and the fact that no one seems to remember that or even think about that uh, suggests that there's no, no one's tracking kind of the, the moral arithmetic uh, for in this current moment. They're just they're not they're not uh, and they're not and, and the fact that they're not disposed to is uh, you know I'm you know I'm afraid to say in large measure due to anti-Semitism. I think that really is the the, the thing that's giving it topspin for so many people. The fact that you have all of these people focused on this conflict, of all the world's conflicts, they're focused on this conflict yeah. uh, on an hourly basis. Where are all the protests about the, you know, the, what the Russians are doing in Ukraine right now? I mean, why, aren't, why aren't our college campuses just on fire with that? Because that, that's a war where the um, there's pretty much no moral ambiguity, right? The, the, the good and evil are arrayed in a perfectly, you know, visible, intelligible, non-debatable way across the, the, you know, the 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 battle lines in that conflict, um, which is to say that Russia is un unambiguously in the wrong, and the the whole war is a war crime, right? Um, where is where are the protests? Where is that? Where where are the tears, you know, shed by by you know celebrities and teenagers on TikTok, right? It's just. Mm -hmm. It's not happening, and the fact that it's not happening says a lot about the the bizarre status of 
of Jews in um, kind of the the political imaginations of of much of humanity. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that I think that you're absolutely right about that, Sam. And you know, back to what you were talking about, um, Douglas's Mur Douglas Murray's you know scenario where he talked about uh, proportionality and responding in a proportional way. And even what we were saying about about Judith Butler, like none of these things would be happening if the tables were turned. You know what I mean? So we we get videos that are actually from Syria or from Yemen, and people claim that they're from Gaza, and they claim that this is happening, and it gets shared, you know, millions of times, millions of views, and everybody's going, oh, look what the Israelis did to these poor Palestinians, when in actuality, that's what's happening in Syria, but nobody seems to care about the Syrian children. But right. it's like the the truth, whatever, the, you know, if, if it was flipped around, if it was Palestinian women being raped and tortured and mutilated versus Israeli women, we wouldn't have people denying it. You know, we always wondered how do people, how could people have possibly denied the Holocaust? Well, we're living it right now where people are denying a reality that's that we saw the GoPro cameras, we saw the yep. videos of what happened, and people are still denying it. And if things yeah. had had been had gone the other way, then it would have been very clear. People would have been it would have been very easy for people to see who the terrorists are and who the victims are. But because you know they they have. Whether I don't where 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 it's coming from, whether it's coming from the anti-Semitism that stems from the Marxist ideology that has taken over our universities, whether it's just because they were all dormant anti-Semites this whole time to a shocking degree. I mean, you saw um, in Congress when the you know there was four three or four university presidents were being asked to just yeah. plainly speak out. I, you know, against your students calling for the genocide of Jewish people, and they couldn't even, it was the simplest possible question, and they couldn't respond to it. So when you see things like that, it just makes you feel like what else could make sense, other than the fact that what I thought was from my background, this obsessive genocidal hate for Jewish people, it didn't surprise me, it never surprised me to see it coming from the Muslim yeah. world, because I grew up in that. And I was yeah. accustomed to it and I expected it. But to see it in the West, it honestly did surprise me. To to hear gas the Jews, you know, for people screaming it with the Sydney Opera House in the background, I did not yeah. expect to see that in my lifetime. You know, it, it, it is quite shocking. Um, but then they'll scream about yeah. Israel is committing a genocide. Do you know what I mean? Like they'll just... They just take reality and they manipulate it and then they repeat it over and over and over and over again. And we know who said that, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, it, it, about repeating the mm -hmm. truth over and over and over again until until people finally believe it. And, and that seems to be what's happening. I mean, it doesn't matter how many times you try to express the truth, the reality, the facts, um, you will be demonized for it. I recently had a, a, a guest on this podcast named Dalia Ziada, who is an Egyptian woman. She is a, a political pundit. And she saw mm. the videos of Shani Luke in the in the truck in those very first days. It was the, one of the first videos I saw um, with the men chasing after the truck, spitting on her. It was clear, like her body was just, you know in a very unnatural form. We didn't know if she was alive or not. Um, mm. And all over the media in the Muslim world, they were claiming that not a single innocent person got hurt, that Hamas were went in there with super politeness into the homes of Israeli people. And they were very respectful. They took off their shoes and they were, <laughs> you know, sitting down. It, like They just have mm. like this, complete nonsense made up craziness that they're stating on like their mainstream media 
And when Dahlia went on her own social media and said, this isn't true, I've seen the videos, this is what actually happened, she was demonized to the point that she had to leave Egypt and she had to seek asylum in another country because it was no mm. longer safe for her to be there. Just because she was trying to state a fact, she was trying to state the truth. Um, so yeah, I don't know what yeah. the, well, what so, the so answer it's is. A very, it's a very muddled it's a very muddled picture because, okay, so you, in trying to assess opinion in the, in the Muslim community, you know, in any community, in, in a Muslim majority society or, or even in the West, um, you run into a couple of problems. One is that, you know, as you just pointed out, there's a, there's a fair amount of, of deception and self-deception and conspiracy thinking, right? Uh, and so when you, when you, for instance, say, when you ask, do you support what Hamas did on October 7th in Israel? And you get something like, you know, 75 or 80 percent, you know, in the Palestinian territory saying, yes, we support that, which is, you know, double that double the that support Hamas. Right. So you have something like 40 percent of support for Hamas, but like double the support for what Hamas did on on October 7th. But then you have to ask yourself, well, of the people who are saying they support what happened on October 7th, how many believe the lies that nothing untoward right. happened, right? That no non-combatants were killed and there were no rapes, et cetera. Um, but then you also have to know that there are people who know precisely what happened and and are fine with it, right? And so that like, and those, are, those are very different groups of people, right? So, and, and in some cases, those, those, those description, those describe the same brain in different time points, right? Because there are, you know, there are, there were people after September 11th who seemed to simultaneously believe that it was all the, you know, a conspiracy run by the Mossad and, you know, 4,000 Jews didn't show up to work on on that day. And also it was a great victory for uh, jihadism because Osama bin Laden and his his ragtag bunch of, of, um, of uh, Mujahideen had accomplished the, so something no, no one could imagine possible, right? They so and, and it's, it's those are not necessarily different brains embracing those two completely discordant propositions so um it is just i mean the, the if you step back from this though i think there are two general principles we have to acknowledge one is that given the history of genocide in particular given the holocaust because now we're talking about anti-semitism and and the jews being targets when any group of people says that they aspire to commit genocide, we should believe them, uh -huh. right? I mean, this is a, Hamas's uh, charter, original charter, was explicit in its genocidal aspirations. Much of the conversation about Jews and Israel in the Muslim world is explicitly genocidal. Given what happened uh, in in the you know, late '30s and '40s in Europe to the Jews. Um, we know we just we simply don't have the the luxury of giving people the benefit of the doubt that they might be exaggerating what they hope to accomplish, because we just we just know that this we know that we're capable of this. You know, we human beings are capable of this, and you know, I I recommend that people study the Holocaust and appreciate the degree to which it was not just a the result of of the Nazis successfully implementing their their bizarre ideology, uh, you know, you know, over the rest of Europe, right? I mean, it was it was a much more organic um, a series of atrocities than that. I mean, the the, the, the yes, the it, it wouldn't have happened but for the Nazis, but the Nazis just gave communities across Europe, in particular Eastern Europe the slightest nudge and they went berserk murdering their jewish neighbors right i mean it was just, i mean it, it just in lithuania and latvia and ukraine and romania and bulgaria and greece i mean it was just croatia it was just country after country it was an organic series of pogroms and and uh, up close and personal murders. It was not that the picture we have of the of the Holocaust as being primarily a machinery of death 
uh, you know, t typified by Auschwitz at the height of its activity is profoundly misleading. It was that too. Ultimately, it was that too. But um, millions died by being, you know, shot in the head or 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 hurled into burning pits alive. Right. I mean, it was just. It, and it, and again, so it was neighbor to neighbor, and there there are accounts of neo Nazis standing back aghast at what you know U Ukrainians and and Lithuanians and Romanians and Hungarians were capable of just given the this you know just given the, and a little bit of encouragement right um and we know that the discourse in the muslim world across the muslim world in dozens of countries around jews is explicitly genocidal in in many of its moments right and and this is taught to children and in addition to aspirations of genocide we have a a martyrology which is even a much greater concern for me because it, you know, it, 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 yeah. it just, it makes a mockery of any kind of deterrence when you're talking about large scale violence, right? We, I mean, we, we have all the makings of a death cult in, in the mainstream religion of Islam, right? It's not to say that all Muslims are a part of this death cult, but you know, the, the core teachings of Islam, you know, you just add water, you get a death cult and, you know that's it's a real problem and so you combine you know martyrology with with uh, you know genocidal aspirations and yeah this is the you know hamas and uh you know analogous groups are a special problem right and and so it's uh, the fact that intellectuals on the left can't see anything can't make sense of anything i just said um is uh is a tremendous liability at this moment. And, you know, for, for that conversation, I mean, there's, there's no one more valuable in, in my view than people like yourself, you know, a, a, your, your ex-Muslim brother brothers and sisters, because you can put the, I mean, the, the thing I can't do and the thing that is endlessly held against me is, is um, that I can't dis, I can't credibly disavow my identity in, for the purpose of that conversation. Right, you know, I I'm white. I'm a white guy. I'm Jewish. Uh, I don't speak the I don't speak Arabic, um, et cetera, et cetera. So when I'm talking to somebody like Rory Stewart, right, he whether he's making those moves explicitly or not, he's gesturing toward that kind of discrepancy in, in the conversation. Like neither of us are at one point he said neither of us are Muslims. Neither neither of us are Muslim scholars, right? Neither of us yes, are fluent in Arabic. Um, and that's just not it, it, it's it's totally irrelevant for, for the conversation. I mean, those are really those are those are not uh, valid argumentative moves, but they appear to be to most audiences, right? So I mean, I, I really do view ex-Muslims as, as having a special power here. I mean, you you really are kryptonite for that for that particular co conversation. Uh, and um, yeah, so anything yeah, I can I mean, do to support you, I want to. You're awesome. Um, you're absolutely correct. We are the whistleblowers, but you know who else knows intimately are the Jewish people from these Arab countries, from Yemen, from Syria, from Iraq, yeah. um, from Egypt, yeah, Iran, yeah. from Morocco, you know, the, the Mizrahi Jews, they know all about this. You know, we've heard Gad Saad talk yeah. about growing up in Lebanon and his teacher asking, what do you want to be when you grow up to all the kids? And his friend that he just played with at recess stood up to say, when I grow up, I want to kill Jews, you know? So that it, it's such a normalized, when you talk about, um, you know, the, the genocidal hate, it, it is, it is so incredibly normalized. It, it is, it's, it's just ubiquitous. It's just a part of the everyday vernacular you know like the the worst insult you could call somebody is a jew when something good happens you say yay a jew has died you know that that's like your your exclamation of joy like it's it's just in in your constantly um these are people most of them haven't even met jewish people let's just let's just put that out there yeah, like yeah. jewish people are just like this 
uh, big, scary boogeyman. Um, but Mizrahi Jewish people know about it. They know all about it. And they're like, I think 40, maybe a higher percentage in, in Israel because they were all kicked out of their homes. They were all kicked out of Egypt yeah. and Yemen and Iraq and Syria and Morocco and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they have their stories and they are under no illusions. I mean, I find that with Ashkenazi Jewish people, there's a lot of um, uh, misunderstanding, a lot of denial as to the, the genocidal obsessive hate that is in the Arab world. You're not going to find that with the Mizrahi Jews. They know all about it. They've, you know, if they haven't experienced it themselves, we have, you know, children are children of Holocaust survivors or in our Eurocentric view, we have those. And then from the, um, from the Arab world, we have children of, or survivors of um, this, you know, what happened in the Arab world with all of these Jewish people being kicked out of their homes um, under threat of imprisonment horrible things happened in countries like Iraq that are not too different from what was happening in Europe at that time. Um, so when you talk about that, just lighting the the match and it just like throughout Europe, everybody was really excited to finally be able to kill all these Jews. That same thing was happening over yeah. in the Middle East as well. So it just does seem to be this, you know, this, this shared hate between you know, it, it, it just seems, I don't understand it. I've tried so hard to understand it. Um, from my perspective, it was always coming from a very religious place. Was, you know, in the yeah. Quran is very clear about um, Allah hates the Jews, therefore you must hate them as well. And you mentioned in Hamas's charter, it's not just their charter, it's a Sahih Hadith. So that means every yeah, yeah. Sunni Muslim believes this to be true. And, I, and, I, and it is more than just Sunnis. I mean, it was Iran is the one who was funding Hamas, right? It's the Shias as well. So and that hadith talked about how Muslims should be killing all the Jews until none survived. And even if a Jew tried to hide behind a rock or a tree, the, the earth itself would call out you know, yeah. to the Muslim and say, there's a, there's a Jew behind there's me. There's a Jew hiding him. behind yeah. me. Come kill him. Yeah. Like that's how desperate they are to kill Jews that rocks and trees are going to start talking. Um, and yeah. so it is part of the, it is part of the religion. And it is that, that was always the source that I could see from the Middle East and from the Arab world. As far well, as that was the, a source, just to be clear, that was also the source in Europe, it's it's just yeah. The, you had two thousand years of Christian fulminating against the Jews as the killers of Christ, and as the the, the one community that sh should have recognized his status as the Messiah and perversely refuses to, and has refused their their their, their continued existence as a as a discernible subgroup is is uh, tantamount to uh, just a a perennial blasphemy against the the one true god the one true religion um mm -hmm. so that was the ground out of which the sort of racial and and nationalistic and anti bolshevik you know political movement of of nazism got spun up but it really it, it, it definitely intersected with this crazed you know theology um that had jew hatred at its root for you know two thousand years, um, so and and you know and to, to some degree, Islam has gotten some of that. I mean, some so, some of, some of Nazism and Christian anti-Semitism got exported into Islam and in, you know in, in the last century, um, but it's you know as you point out, it's, it's it was there already. Yeah, it was there already, and it was you know Muhammad had a had a real thing for Jews very specifically. Obviously, mm -hmm. he he hated Christians as well and all non-believers, but there was a specific hate for Jews. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the genocides happened when he was alive, he was involved in, in Haibar. So they, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's definitely uh, an integral part of the religion. Um, I want to talk about a quote that you have. It's a very prophetic quote, which, I have repeated in many interviews, it's been playing over and over in my head since October 7th, 
It's when you said the truth is we're all living in Israel. It's just that some of us haven't realized it yet. I find that it's so true that liberal thinkers in the West, you, you talked about this before, how they just don't believe that the religious zealotry is actually real. So you talked about the yeah. source being Christianity in, in Europe and the source being Islam and in the Middle East. They really just won't accept that. They'll have to come up with geopolitical reasons. They'll have to come up with other explanations, which, you know, obviously there are probably lots of factors working together at the same time, but they just dismiss the religious zealotry. They don't understand it. They haven't lived it. They don't get it. And they refuse to believe that it's as powerful as it is. And when when I try to speak up, when I try to explain that, I look like I am just an alarmist, you know, like they just think that yeah. there's no way that what you're saying could be true, even though they are familiar. We're talking about Hamas and what happened on October 7th, but it's like there's in Nigeria, Christians are being killed, you know, in Pakistan, Hindus are being killed. Like this is not specific to just Israel right. and Gaza. We have to remember that this is a global problem. Again, like I said before, it's Iran that was funding Hamas. There are all of these Islamists, all of these terrorists, all of these, you know, Islamic extremists, they all have that same goal. They are all following the same doctrine. They're all following the same book. But people don't want to hear and that. There they don't are, want to accept also... that. There's murderous sectarianism within the Muslim community too. Yeah. I mean, you put the, the division between Sunni and Shia. I mean, like in Pakistan, you'll have you'll have you know Shia or Sunni mosques blown up by the you know the other tribe. Um, it has nothing to do with Jews or Israel or America or Western foreign policy. It's a, a purely you know a sectarian religious hatred. And yeah, I mean, people don't people imagine that that religion is always invoked as just a pretext for underlying motives that have nothing to do with a sincere belief in paradise or that's why you're saying that yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so do you think like what how much worse do you think this will get for israel and for the world before it gets any better do you see how do you see this playing out or potentially resolving um, you know, I don't know. There's just, there's so, it's so muddled out there right now. So many people are so confused. Um, and if they're unwilling to point to the, to the root of Hamas's genocidal tendencies, and if they're going to continue to call them, you know, freedom fighters or revolutionaries and stuff like that, Aren't they just all sitting ducks at this point because they're just unwilling to acknowledge the enemy that wants them dead? Hmm. Well, again, there, there are gradations to it, and, and I'm worried about the the you know several you know bands out from you know the the pure jihadists too. So I mean, I'm uh, you know it's it's it seems only distinguished between Hamas and the Palestinians gen generally, but. The truth is, I don't know how far that distinction runs uh, in every case, right? And so there's, um, uh, and this is true of every Muslim community, right? This, this is true of, you know, like when you have a demonstration in the streets of London with, you know, three or 400,000 people seeming to take the side of Hamas, and you can you can identify groups in that crowd that are, are chanting, um, you know, explicitly for, you know, Sharia law in Britain, um, I mean, it seems to me that that Britain has a real problem on its hands. Is it has too many Islamists and jihadists, you know, within its borders, right? That's just it. And so the question is, what to do about that? And um, what can any open society do about that? It's just a, it's a much bigger problem than, than what's happening in Israel at the moment, um, mm -hmm. or what's happening in Gaza. And I don't. And and the you know if Israel declared a ceasefire or if you know israel disappeared or if uh, you know they won the war and it was over and they were triumphant or you know, however that resolved itself 
that doesn't resolve this larger problem. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm worried about the streets of London. I'm worried about, you know, I'm worried about Paris. I'm worried about, I, 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 I don't want the United States to be anything like many of these Western European countries that did a very bad job of integrating Muslim immigrants, right? I mean, they've, which would say they just have failed to do it. They have, they have invited too many people into their society who have no intention of assimilating to the values of, of that society, them. right? Yeah. And, and the fact that I sound like a racist asshole uh, saying any of this is a problem because it has mm -hmm. to be said. And, and if, if you, if you make it sufficiently uncomfortable for well-intentioned politically liberal people like myself to say these things, these obvious truths, only the racist assholes will, will have thick enough skins to, to be, the, to say them. Right. And eventually Democratic societies will promote racist assholes to the positions of power because they'll, they'll recognize their survival depends on it, right? I mean, this is a point that many of us have made. If you, if yeah. liberals won't enforce borders, fascists will, and liberal societies will will elect fascists to do that. Um, and so I worry about that. I worry about the way in which the failure of the left to acknowledge the obvious here will only empower the right. You know, we, in in America, it'll give us Trump again. Um, well, you know, and or ultimately worse. And in in Europe, it, you know, it'll empower all kinds of you know right wing uh, political movements uh, for understandable reasons. And it's completely unnecessary because this is just this is such an obvious problem, right? Mm -hmm. You you can't you can, an open society can only accommodate a certain number of people who want to destroy it before before it suffers some real harm right and these people the, 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 there's nothing clever about what the jihadists and the islamists do here they they don't hide their aspirations no. right they're like you you stick a microphone in front of their face and they tell you exactly what they want out of life right mm -hmm. um and it is just happens to be antithetical to everything that that tolerant uh, you know, well-adjusted secular people want and should want. And so at a certain point, we have to defend our values and we have to cease to worry about being called names from the people who can't understand the the, the crisis we're, we're meandering toward. Beautifully stated. So there's no doubt that we're in agreement that jihadis and Islamists are a huge threat to the planet. Um, despite anyone's reservations with Israel or Zionism, it obviously pales in comparison. Um, but I want to ask you about our mutual friend, Jay Shapiro, who was on this podcast, and he felt that the two issues feed each other. So he mm -hmm. felt that dissolving Israel as a Jewish state will placate the Islamists and then they'll no longer have an excuse uh, and and then everything will be calm and there will be peace in the Middle East. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you, you can imagine my thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> I mean, it just it, it's just obviously not true, right? I mean, even if, if, it, if it were true, we might wonder about the morality or wisdom of, of um operating on the basis of that truth, but it's just obviously not true. When you look at what jihadist groups want, right? And if you look, if you just follow what the, the Islamic State was up to, what it thought it was up to, what it said of itself when given the chance and what it, what it said of itself in private, it's, you know, private communications, right? Um, we, we know what um, uh Abu Bakr al Baghdadi and uh, Zarqawi, and I mean, we we know what they what these people said to members of Al Qaeda who they considered less committed to the cause than themselves, right? Mm -hmm. We just know the, 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 this had nothing to do with solidarity with the Palestinians, right? This is just not that you know they, whenever the whenever Osama bin Laden talked about the Palestinians, it was an afterthought on on an afterthought, right? It was just not. You know, it was it was just a, a a casual manipulation of of Western public opinion, but no, the core is, um, and 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 well, and this is this is interesting. I don't know that it matters in the current moment, but it's just 
this thing gets darker than Hamas, right? I mean, the Islamic State mm -hmm. was was um, by every measure worse than Hamas. And and what is what is so what's been so shocking? Uh, what was so shocking about October seventh, and and shocking since is just the degree to which. Hamas surprised everyone in being a, a, a pale imitation of the Islamic State, right? I mean, they just thought, oh, we didn't think they were that much like the Islamic State. Uh, and it they just proved that they were capable of, of that sort of atrocity um, for which the Islamic State just became synonymous. Um, but, you know, from my point of view, I, mean, I think members of Hamas, even after October 7th, would still be considered apostates from the point of view of the Islamic State, given that they've got these, you know, the all too terrestrial goals of having a, a nation state in in Palestine and that they are they seem to be engaging the Jews, you know, in a way that's out of sequence with, with Islamic prophecy. And, you know, they're not committed to a global caliphate in quite the way that that they should be, and they're you know they're they're breaking bread with 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 Shia, you know. I mean, they're the, the Iranian support is just this this crazily um, opportunistic um, and all too um, you know non theological alliance. Um, the, the 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 core of jihadism uh, has nothing in principle to do with. Israel or Jews, as much as you know, it is genocidal with respect to the Jews. Um, it's a much bigger game, at least in its own mm -hmm. mind, and it has to be treated as such. Yeah, that's that's the key here. You mentioned a global caliphate. You know, Jews are just the first in line; they're just the canaries, you know, in the coal mine. But even if Israel ceases to exist, that's not going to placate them. They're just going to move on. You're just going to be like, okay, let's well, move into it Europe. It would be now. even worse. It would be even worse than that. It would be a sign uh, that that victory was yeah. was that much oh, closer, gosh. right? It, it, it would be. I mean, just imagine the triumphal celebration, not just among jihadists, but among Muslims the world over. I, I mean, see it in, happening. I would expect October to see 7th. dancing in the streets in a hundred countries, right? Um, it would just be, you know, if and and this is just worth understanding if if iran or you know, you know better still some sunni regime destroyed israel and just killed everyone there you would expect to see the biggest party ever thrown in the muslim mm -hmm. world the world that's over that's just the right? first I mean, domino that, that, yeah it, it would be pure joy um mm -hmm. that should be sobering and, and conversely this is a, a thought experiment I used on Rory, uh, and you know, no one seems to understand the implications of this as much as I walk them headfirst into it. If um, the the IDF were to turn turn the tables on on Hamas and say, "Listen," and on the rest of the world, and, and say, "Listen, we you know we we agree we've killed too many Palestinian women and children. This is just awful. We realize we just can't wage war like this anymore." We don't want to kill any Palestinians. We never wanted to. We, 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 you know, you forced our hands, and and we're now quite mortified to have killed as many as we killed. So we're not, we're not going to kill anyone else. Um, but uh, we want the hostages back. So if you don't give them back within the next twenty four hours, we're going to destroy the Al Aqsa Mosque, right? Not going to kill anyone in the process. Just going to knock down this building, which we don't much like. What would happen, right? As they began to detonate that that building um we know what would happen something like world war three would be unavoidable right the entire muslim world would go off the rails immediately you know with a single you know just convulsion um and no one seems to realize that that is absolutely diagnostic for a level of religious fanaticism that we can't tolerate. We, the West, we, you know, secular, sane, open societies, we can't live with that level of religious fanaticism. That, that this, that we're talking about a civilization. We're talking about m hundreds of millions of people at a minimum. You know, I don't know what percentage of, of the world's two billion Muslims, but hundreds of millions, no question, would want, uh, would, would 
clamor for genocide in response to the destruction of a building. Right. And that's not uh, something we can digest into our societies, and it's not something we can play nicely with at our borders when when nations come you know, into conflict. And evidence of that is how they reacted to Salman Rushdie writing a novel, or Charlie Hebdo yeah. drawing a cartoon, or you know Danish media printing cartoons. You know what I mean? Like we we have seen this all before. Um, so we know that's yeah. what the reaction is going to be. And and still, you know, people will will deny it. But I'm glad that you are being very honest and straightforward and being factual, because that is really helpful, you know, in in a time mm. when if you try to speak about your I mean, you talked about you don't know how you can, you know, how muddy is the difference between Palestinians and Hamas. And I agree with you. It is a very muddy line. That I mean, you, my father is from Gaza, born and raised. And I grew up with my mom being Egyptian and just fully anti-Semitic, just fully hating Jewish people. Like there's no, just wanting them all dead. Mm. It was very clean for her. Um, but my dad didn't. He wasn't an anti-Semite. He lived in Gaza when it was under Israel, when there were hmm. Jewish people still living in Gaza at the time. And his problem was always the brotherhood, obviously Hamas. You know, he was mortified hmm. that his homeland was like the the sort of the, the face of his homeland to the world were terrorists. You know, when you think of Gaza, you think of Hamas, and that really upset him. He felt like that, that that's just so yeah. embarrassing. But, you know, he was, as much as he spoke out after 2005, after Hamas took over, it's when he started his YouTube channel and his Facebook page, and he was trying to speak as much as he could, he was being attacked left, right, and center constantly by his not just the community and the society, but like his family, even they could mm. not handle that. He was not as hateful towards Israel as he should be, you know, um, because he really believed in civil liberties and, you know, freedom of choice and freedom of religion and, and things like that. And he detested Hamas and detested the brotherhood. You can understand why him and my mom didn't work out. Um, mm. And so it's like people like my dad were so few and far between that now, you know, he's he's since passed away. But the voices that are speaking up, the pro-peace Palestinian voices, I know them all because they were his friends. Like they're a tiny group mm -hmm. of people, you know. Right. Um, now, after Hamas has wreaked all of this mm -hmm. havoc on the Gazan people, they're starving, they're suffering while they're living the high life in Qatar in their, you know, they've got their private jets and their billions of dollars and they're living comfortably or they're down in the tunnels protected from the bombs that are falling while it's the Gazan people that are suffering. Now the people are speaking up against Hamas. You know, there's all sorts of graffiti all over Gaza where it's like God curse Hamas and God curse um, the leaders of Hamas and what they've done to us and stuff like that. You see them in the streets with their with their signs. Now they feel empowered that they can do that. When they tried to do that before, they were gunned down in the streets. You know, they had a, a, mm. a campaign called "We Want to Live," and just just want just saying we want to live, and it was the hashtag, and a few of them rode on the streets. They were being not just were they being arrested, but their whole families were being arrested. Um, you know, if they ran yeah. businesses, suddenly those businesses were being forced to like comply with all of these made up rules or they shut them down. So, you know what I mean? They were just suffering all sorts of persecution because they dared to speak up against their their terrorist leaders. Um, yeah. So, yes, those people exist, but it's unfortunate that the ideology of hate um, is greater 
And, you know, my dad had the, the, the privilege, I guess, of having left Gaza when he was 18. He went back to visit every now and then, but he was living in Canada most of his life. And he had that distance, you know, but when you're living in Gaza, you're just like immersed in it. You've seen it. You've seen, I'm sure, the stores mm. called Hitler with the knives taped to the hands of the mannequins. I'm sure you've seen the, you know, the the puppets that they have for kids on TV, mm. where it's like teaching them about stabbing yep. Jews and stuff like that. Like it's just you're in, like you're like in the in that swimming in that water constantly. Um. So yeah. So I yeah. Think, so you know, I I'm not especially judgmental of someone living, you know, under a totalitarian regime, you know, or a terrorist regime, you know, not having the courage to stand up and, and criticize their overlords, at, uh, you know, under pain of death or, you know, death to their families, right? I mean, that's, that, that takes extraordinary courage. And I can, I can imagine within any present decade, just there not being enough people to successfully do that so so that you know for all intents and purposes it's just a hostage crisis right and there's nothing mm -hmm. there's nothing for people to do in gaza say or you know or in syria or in iraq or you know under the islamic state or you, you pick your place uh iran but when you're talking about the muslim community outside of those countries right the the, the thing that is most toxic uh from my point of view is the reflexive solidarity that that muslims living in free societies show toward muslims the world over who are behaving like total psychopaths right just because they're fellow muslims right any conflict between non-muslims and muslims can be expected to be framed by muslims in the u.s or in western europe as an attack upon their brothers and sisters, right? Uh, by non-Muslims and by infidels, by colonialists, by Zionists, right? And that is just, the, I mean, that's the thing that I think we have to lose our patience for, right? You know, I have endless patience for someone who's an a actual hostage not being able to free him or herself in under a theocracy, but somebody who's living in London, you know, with enjoying all the freedoms of a Western society and might might even be on the dole in London, uh, not contributing, uh, you know, especially useful uh, content or anything else to to uh, Western culture, uh, who's taking the side of Hamas or taking the side of the Islamic State or taking the side of the theocracy in Iran, um, whenever it rubs up against secular liberal people who are just trying to build a, a viable civilization uh, and a tolerant one i just think i mean that that has to be seen for what it is right i mean it's just it's it's a it's a political evil right and it's it it's not and the fact that we have liberals who are taken in by it because their concerns about colonialism and their white guilt and their concerns about racism and all of it just lines up and is it just so readily hacked by this appeal to, you know, a, a minority grievance, right, or a brown skin grievance, or an anti-colonial grievance, um, it's just it's just pure stupidity. Um, and you know, we just I mean, again, ex-Muslims, uh, and you know, and also just people from the region, you know, you know, Middle Eastern Christians and Jews too, are in a position to point this out in a way that cuts through the identity politics. And it's just, you know, the, in that case, um, you know, I just think your voices need to be amplified. Well, you know, I appreciate that. But, you know, unfortunately, as you n know very well, um, our voices are politically incorrect. You know, nobody wants to hear from us. It, we're best ignored even. Like we're not even, yeah. we're not even responded to um, because they just they just wouldn't know what to do with us. Um, but what yeah, you're saying compute. is absolutely I mean, it doesn't compute exactly. Yeah. No.
Um, but what you're saying is absolutely true. And that stems from this idea of the ummah, of the Islamic community. So it doesn't, there's, you know, 57 Muslim majority countries or whatever, but no, mm. it's 57. My God, is there that many? Good. Yeah, I think wow. it's fifty-five. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's. I think there's like twenty-two official Muslim states, but like fifty over fifty-five Muslim majority countries. Yeah, and even the ones that aren't majority. I mean, I was born and raised in Canada. You were speaking with Majid, born and raised in the UK, and he told you the same sort of story that they told yeah. us, which is just because you're born in a barn doesn't make you a horse. Just because you're born in Britain doesn't make you British. Just because you're born in America doesn't make you American. You are Muslim first. And that, you know, allegiance, that loyalty to being Muslim first is so ingrained. It's like you, I, like I mentioned in my book, it was to the point that my mom would question me, would make me answer if I would be willing to kill my non-Muslim friends if the global caliphate made it to Canada. You know, like you really have to be, honestly, like it's that, it's that crazy. It's that important that you always remember it is us and them we are superior we are good they if they do not convert must be killed so that us and them you know i you know, in my in this podcast i've had countless people come on and tell stories of how they weren't allowed to have non-muslim friends because you're not supposed to again this is from the quran don't be friends with christians or jews um and so even though you're born and raised in these countries and you're living in these countries, the reason you, you talked about France and other countries' failure to integrate, and I think that's true, but they failed yeah. to vet first and foremost because they they didn't vet and they let in people that no matter what you do, they will never yeah. integrate. They do not want to integrate. Yeah. There is nothing you can do for them. You know, you've got the the mayor of London lighting up the streets with these Ramadan lights. It doesn't matter. They're still going to hate you. Light up all the lights yeah. you want. It doesn't matter. You're not going to placate them. They they still talk about publicly, as you mentioned, they're there on their YouTube channels having conversations about we live in Britain, but we hate the Brits and we hate this country and we hate being surrounded by non-Muslims. You know, that's what I grew up in. So that us versus mm -hmm. them, whenever anything happens in the world, anywhere, and if there's Muslims on one side and it doesn't matter who, doesn't matter if it's terrorists, you're gonna, you have to side with them because if you don't, then you are a them, then you are an other and there's nothing worse than than being the other, right? So it, it it's that, it, it, it's such a long story, you know, before it gets to the point of, um, you know, it's like when ISIS started up in, in Iraq and Syria, why did you have people from Germany and England and Canada and America burning their passports and going to join the caliphate like that, right? Mm. People are saying, oh, they were groomed online. They were groomed online in three weeks? No, they yeah. were not. Yeah. You know, they, they were groomed yeah, that's from quite, that's birth. quite a pitch, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that, it, you know, when this, this is the saddest part of, of what I'm about to say right now. When October 7th happened, it wasn't only Muslims. It was also Christians and even atheists from the Arab world because they, they're still a part of that us and them mm. mentality. Even though, you know, they just, they really see Jews as the other. And if yeah. it's whoever versus the Jews, even though it's a terrorist group, you're going to side with them because being on the side of the Jews is just like beyond, you know, they, they are the worst of humanity. So um, there's no way that you're going to, you're going to side with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there are different aspects of this that are, you know, you, they can be summer, they can be talked about in, in general as, um, you know, just the, the, the consequences of religious ideology in this case, but I mean, there's there's just generic tribalism, right? Which which yeah. may actually be, be uncoupled from ideology, right? So you may you, you know, yeah. so I'm I'm obviously most concerned when all of the dials are turned to eleven and you have 
everything in place. You have tribalism, but on top, uh, but beneath that, you have religious ideology that is sincerely believed and uh, gives voice to to things like you know specific principles like you know death to apostates, death death to blasphemers, an expectation of you know paradise for martyrs. I mean, like all of the one, once those dominoes begin to fall in a person's brain that's someone we can no longer talk to right that's someone who's mm -hmm. who has kicked themselves loose of the earth and they're, and they're just they're not open to being persuaded i mean in the rare case i'm sure there are you know jihadists who come back from the brink i, I know that's the case but in general you know i just don't think we can rationally hope to persuade people who went all in for the islamic state right i mean the, 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 like these people are the enemies of civilization right so mm -hmm. um you know we we lock them in prison when we can and we fight them uh when we have to and but we shouldn't be inviting them into our open societies and, and tying ourselves in knots trying to figure out you know how to criticize them mm -hmm. they're here right um and calling it islamophobia uh, when <laughs> someone points out the you know the obvious pathology in their their worldview yeah and not to mention all of the victims that are left under that whether it's you know yeah victims of the rape gangs and the muslim and victims yeah, or the, 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 muslim, the, the victims, muslim free girls. thinkers and the women yeah that's right that's yeah. right the that the victims of fgm mm -hmm. and child marriage and and yada yada you can't criticize it because it's islamophobic so you're basically protecting protecting the the perpetrators of this kind of violence on on women and minorities um so yeah. let's try and get some something some hope <laughs> something positive mm. here <laughs> this, um, this hasn't been a barrel of laughs, <laughs> well it's always a joy to hang out with you sam but yeah. but no it's been really yeah. dark and sad and and uh depressing but let's go to thinking about best case scenario october 7th happened mm. obviously like i immediately wrote an article saying like that's the end of Gaza. we're done you know like i, I can't the two-state solution forget it like none of this is going to happen anymore um mm -hmm. do you agree with that do you think that there is some way that we can we can move forward um how do you you know if you had a magic wand how would you hope for this conflict to to resolve for both Palestinians and Israelis um, to be feeling safe and um, you know like their their human rights have been uh, cared for? Just you know, I share your um, your doubt that a two-state solution is is workable uh now or in any near future i mean i, I don't know what the alternative to a two-state solution is but i can't imagine one being being created um i mean i just yeah i, I mean maybe there's a, you know maybe there's some amazing surprise that could be achieved here when if, you know if israel made peace with all of its Sunni neighbors and the Sunni neighbors went all in on reconstructing Gaza and the West Bank and policing it and and propping it up and making it wealthy and re-educating it and and you know so we had they had you know surprisingly secular partners in among the Saudis and the Emiratis etc. Let's say all that happened. Everyone just cares about about wealth and and integrating in, in a modern economy now. Let's say that happens and they become effectively de-radicalized, you know, which, which which to some degree has happened in the at least among the, the leaders in of some of those countries, right? I mean, they're 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 um, you know, they have quite cynically exported their jihadism to the rest of the world for for more than a generation. But um, let's say they stop all that. I I, I guess there's some possible, you know, two state solution that again would would require the the um. The rest of the you know the the Arab world to get involved uh, in a way that was benign, uh, and for the Palestinians to to acquiesce to all that uh, and to obviously get rid of Hamas as a leadership, um, I you know maybe that's possible. It's just it's just hard to it's hard to picture. 
um I, yeah i don't you know uh, in the in the limit it's, it's hard to picture how israel is is viable right i mean without some kind of sea change in in muslim attitudes you know with some it's 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 just i don't know what the end game is for for israel given the nature of the conflict so far so i, I don't know i don't know what's rational to hope for there i mean it's you know, I, Jay, that th this would be a remedy if Israel just decided to disappear, and you know all Jews decided just to assimilate in the West. But it might, in fact, be what happens uh, at some point. Um, and you know, my, my view about Israel has always been somewhat paradoxical because I've never, you know, I've I've never thought it should exist as a Jewish state. I mean, that, you know, being a an atheist with the idea of a, a state organized around a religion. Seems just in principle obnoxious to me. Um, yeah, but we you know, have so many Muslim ones, and nobody seems yeah, to be yeah, bothered yeah. by them. Exactly. Yeah, but but so I don't obviously I don't think there should be Muslim or Christian states either. Um, but I mean, if it's it, if it ha if there was going to be one religious state, that's the, the the Jewish state is the one that is justified in my view given the genocidal anti-Semitism of so much of the world, right? And and given that, mm -hmm. that it, in fact, I think is is real still, right? I mean, but before October 7th, I might have said that anti-Semitism of, of, of a sort that we really had to worry about, I mean, just el eliminationist anti-Semitism, as much as, you know, there's there's that, that attitude among Muslims, it's not something that the Jews really have to worry about uh, certainly not in the West, right? And I, I can no longer say that. I mean, I just think that there's so mm -hmm. much moral confusion now that a another Holocaust is conceivable even in the West, given a few, you know, changes to to um to uh, you know to history uh, in the coming years. I mean, I just, I just, uh, for me, like there is no, there's no, li there's no limit in principle to where this could go given how insane uh people prove themselves to be again in the immediate aftermath of October 7th before Israel had done anything in response right i mean that's the that's the thing that i just can't unsee the fact that people took hamas aside when all we had was the gopro evidence yeah. of what had happened right and no bombs had had fallen yet um so, yeah, I don't know what it's rational to hope for. I mean, I just think the, um, I, I honestly, I, I think there is no substitute in this case, for, and this is true for Hamas, it's true for every jihadist organization, it's, it's true for the whole jihadist and Islamist project throughout the Muslim world. There's no substitute for complete defeat, right? Just unambiguous defeat. And in the same way that there was no substitute for a true defeat of Nazi Germany and a true defeat of, you know, imperialist Japan, right? Like the, the, these cultures needed to lose and they needed a reckoning with their loss, right? They needed, they, they, they couldn't, there couldn't be any scope for self-deception that the project still was you know totally viable and may yet prove triumphant but this is just a, a, a setback for the moment right i mean nazi germany had to be brought to its knees and we the, we had to try the leadership and insofar as that you know that the project didn't work perfectly but you know the nuremberg trials accomplished something and yes a lot of people escaped to south america but it was um it was a resounding defeat right you, you couldn't walk away from that from the rubble of of uh, germany and you know, after 1945 and say well you know the nazis may still conquer the world and we may still have a thousand year reich etc so so islamist and jihadist triumphalism has to be fatally embarrassed so what does that mm -hmm. mean um i think it means killing jihadists in many places uh, much of the time. And I think a lot of that should be um, covert. You know, I don't think we have to keep 
you know, announcing that we're doing it, you know, we being the West, Western powers and, and our allies, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa and everywhere else. I just think it has to happen. Boko Haram, you know, if you're if you're a member of Boko mm-hmm. Haram, you it, that you should just have a short life expectancy, right? For all the pointless misery you're heaping upon um your neighbors in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean it's just it, it's got again, it's got nothing to do with the US, at least not most of the time, right? Um and much less Israel. Uh but if you're going to, you know, capture Nigerian schoolgirls and force them to be sex slaves. I mean, it's, it's, yes, mm-hmm. you should, your neighbors should kill you and we should figure out how to help that happen. Um, the, um, but more, more generally, I just think it has to be proven unworkable in, in this larger project of building a viable civilization, right? So you could ask yourself what would happen if, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the unluckiest features here is that there's been so much wealth pulled out of the ground in the you know, yeah. you know the Middle Eastern petro states that they haven't had to confront the fact that uh, that that their culture is is basically intellectually bankrupt, right? It doesn't produce anything the rest of the world or even the, their own societies can use to do anything valuable, really, um, apart from rage against the infidel. Uh, when it comes time to having you get into conflict with other other cultures, right? So it's just it's not you you can't get wealthy being an Islamist or, jih- or a jihadist unless you can pull that money directly out of the ground. Um, so I just think the you know it, it would have been great if we had gotten off oil a generation ago, you know, and it would be great to do that at the first. I mean, America is virtually doing that now in that we're you know basically energy independent. I mean, we're still on oil, but now it's our own oil and and uh, natural gas. Um, but I just think the the economic and cultural unviability of the whole Islamist and jihadist project has to be demonstrated, right? And it just I mean, so so. Fundamentalist Islam, I mean, to, to cast a you know a slightly wider footprint there, there, just has to lose. You know, I mean, I think fundamentalist Christianity has to lose too. I mean, all of these these medieval commitments have to, you know, when they when they bump up against modernity, they have to be embarrassed. They have to be uh, chastened um, and humbled and ultimately humiliated. I mean, it's because. Again, they're they're they create a kind of tribalism that, when push comes to shove, just reliably proves murderous, right? It just we mm-hmm. it's just it's not it's indigestible, right? It's not it, we can't play nicely with it. It's not a it does it's it doesn't admit of the sort of the normal accommodations we make politically with, when when opinions differ about what we should do and values are not perfectly aligned right you just you can't there are no there are no real concessions that can be made because these are sacred objects these are sacred principles right these are again these are people who are willing to die and see their children die and murder the children of other people over buildings right and books that may or that are that are merely rumored to have been burned somewhere by someone Mm -hmm. right you know, you misname a teddy bear in, I think this was in Sudan, right? And thousands of people take to the streets and begin killing one another, right? It's just, it's it's completely berserk. And the fact that any liberal secular person can't immediately see how suicidally idiotic all of this is uh, to tolerate for a moment is just is is just a, a sign of this. Of this of our civilization right so we just we have to get our heads screwed on straight we in the west and um we have to hold the line against all this stuff yeah absolutely agree and i think we're going to be forced to do that um with iran for example allying with russia and china i don't know if you saw yep. putin coming out as pro-palestine <laughs> Um, mm. And of course, yeah. the Hamas jihadists are, you know, they were almost immediately in Russia. Um, and so that's very concerning to me because it's not it's not just one source of evil. It's like the trifecta of evil. 
and and they're all allying with each other. And I think that all of our, you know, what you were what you were talking about just there, you know, like all of our inability to accept the reality that's in front of us or to defend our values. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to be forced to do that very soon. Um, unfortunately, mm. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how pessimistic I am about it, but it, it's definitely terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's, I, I'll be surprised, you know, I don't really have a time frame for this, but I mean, I, I will. I will definitely be surprised if we avoid a war with Iran at this point. I mean, we, we have a you know we have a sort of uh, a minor war with Iran happening with their proxies already, and I, I say mm -hmm. you know we you know Israel and and its Western allies, the United States, uh, chief among them. I, I just don't see how a war with Iran doesn't happen in some sense. Uh, I mean, it's just, and I, and I don't see how a nuclear armed Iran is, is um, something that we're uh, going to let happen. So, and it could happen very quickly. So, um, and there's just, you know, there, you know, obviously there are other flashpoints I and mean, there's just India and Pakistan, right? The, both of, mm -hmm. both of which are already nuclear armed, right? Again, this has nothing in principle to do with, with Israel or America or the West, but like you could easily see a, a, a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So it's just, and again, that would be another symptom of of religiously inspired tribal lunacy. Um, but so um, yeah, I mean, I, near, near term, I'm worried about. I, I now, I know <laughs> these reflections have gotten even more cheerful since you asked for <laughs> for the good news. But um, yeah, war with Iran is uh, is something that I, I do do worry about it. It, it it seems more probable than not to me yeah yep um i we and, have and, a lot and what of it, it's it's worth acknowledging what a tragedy that that would be given the vast numbers of innocent iranians who are sick of living under yes. theocracy right mm -hmm. i mean like they're not even I mean, when you talk about when i when i worry about there being no bright line between Hamas and the rest of the Palestinian population um, in Iran. I mean, again, I, you know, I haven't traveled there, uh, so, so I just know this secondhand from reading books and and articles. But it really seems like there's a bright line between the theocrats Definitely. and much of the society, right? I mean, it's just it's that really is a hostage crisis, right? And so mm -hmm. the idea that we could have a war with that country. Uh, is just you know absolutely nauseating. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, on that bright so note. Now that I've cheered you up, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> I'm actually going to open it up to the group here. Um, we actually have a lot of Iranians with us. I can see Amir is with us here, who is a, a great fan of yours. Um, and he's got his hand up already. <laughs> mm. uh, so maybe Amir, you I'm here. Want to if anyone wants to, to tell me anything I'm wrong about here, if yeah, I mean, I, I I love to meet you all, and and I appreciate any appreciation. But if there's something I'm getting wrong, if there's if there's something I'm tone deaf about, if you think I'm just put my foot in my mouth on one or another points, I would love to hear that because I I view you as a uh, as a you know, if you're in Yasmin's corner. Um, you know, I view you as a, as a brain trust on on these issues. So, let me have it if I made any if I make any mistakes here. Amir, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, and and let Sam know your thoughts on his thoughts on Iran. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I swear you get more beautiful every time I see you, which is weird. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> hi, Sam. Um, hey. I think uh, just the preface, uh, as uh, Yaz mentioned, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I, th I think you're probably the most uncomfortable person on earth when it comes to receiving compliments. It's usually, you know, oh, nice. Uh, and <laughs> that, that, that is it. But <laughs> I've been, I've been following yeah. you. For... I'm, I'm bad at receiving compliments. That's a good, that's a good criticism. Yeah, you, 
<laughs> you're absolutely terrible <laughs> at it. Uh, and, but, <laughs> but I think Brett Weinstein was uh, not Brett Weinstein. Sorry, Brett Stevens was wrong uh, when he said you're a national treasure. You're you're an international treasure, and genuine uh, no person on earth has dead or alive has had more impact on my life than you. Oh, wow. So. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, I, I was going to ask a question about where I think you you are wrong, but you haven't touched on it in this, and maybe your thoughts have changed, or maybe I've misunderstood it. But you have alluded to a a, a commitment to the, a project of reforming Islam. I don't know where mm. you stand on that, but. What I was gonna, I was gonna make this uh, topic even more, uh, this session even more pessimistic by saying that that's a quixotic pipe dream. That it's you know, yeah. it, it's just never going to happen. There is no, there is no Islamism or jihadism. There is only Islam, and exactly like you said, being convinced that it's it's the word of God. There are no earthly arguments against that. But since you haven't touched mm. on it, and Yas asked right, me right. To, to mention something about Iran, you know, being Iranian myself, um, not that that makes me an expert in any way, but my my impression would be that a, a war would almost be welcomed because all the other avenues by the the opponent of the theocracy uh, theocratic regimes of Iran has been exhausted and no progress has been made. And um, I think it was someone who, on your podcast who did say that we're not talking about, you know, one or two per people uh, being in that sort of regime. We're talking about thousands of people. Uh, so there is no just cut off the head and democracy will follow. Mm. It, there is no other option than war, I believe. And I think a lot of Iranians would welcome that, to be honest. That, but that's mm. just my impression. So I, I leave that there for you to uh, unpack. And again, thank you for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm still bad at receiving compliments, especially one that large. So uh, apologies, uh, but thank you. Um, well, so your first point, I, you know, you know, as you know, I had a, a long conversation with with Majid Nawaz about just the, the prospects of reform in Islam. Um, I've never known how pessimistic to be about that project, I, but I just don't know what the alternative is, right? And, and if and if by reform, I I don't mean that we can realistically expect that the doctrine itself will get you know successfully edited for all time, or the you know the, you know the Quran will be a different document, or the Hadith will be will be trimmed down, etc., and you know, we'll change the biography of Muhammad. I mean, we, that's not going to happen, but. I mean, so there's something that has happened to Christianity. Like it, the burden is upon us to explain the difference between modern Christians and the Christians of the 14th century. Like, it was like what happened there that made them better, you know, in the aggregate and and more, um, you know, easier to deal with, even if you can find some extreme Christians who still want to see, you know, blasphemers put to death or or homosexuals put to death. Um, there's not that many of them. It's hard to see them becoming politically effective. Again, the, the source code is there to allow for it. I mean, you, there's there. It would be possible to to you know have, create a, a Christian cult that was every bit as crazy as the craziest Christians of the 14th century. I mean, you can just find you can you can just do what they did with the texts. Um, but if you imagine some process, you know, some secularizing, modernizing process which manages to make, you know, 95% of Muslims as as liberal and tolerant as the best, you know, 5% now, right? And, but while still, while, while not being apostates, while still being Muslims, while thinking of themselves as Muslims, while still, you know, going to, going to the mosque, uh, you know, albeit maybe only occasionally, right? I mean, they still think they're religious and they still think they're, they're, they're they're um they haven't given up on the project or the identity but they have you know there's whole sections of scripture they they're inclined to ignore and they just don't you know they're, they're basically like liberal christians you know compared to the christians of the 14th century i don't you know something like that's got to be possible because 
it's it's possible to, for people to totally apostatize like like Yasmin, right? Like and and just to lose their faith and and so so the, every every gradation of of loss of of ideology is possible. Um and we could call that reforming Islam, right? Uh, but it's um I'm not I mean given the the clarity of the doctrine and given how short the Quran is, I mean, given how how it doesn't have the advantage that Christianity has of of just being va a vast uh based on a vast literature which is totally self-contradictory, right? It's not it's not as vast and it's not as self-contradictory, the, the doctrine that gives you Islam. So it's it's harder to effectively edit. It's harder to 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 take it a la carte. So yeah, I'm worried. I'm worried that you're right, that there is just no, you know, that that it's a kind of a fool's um hope to to think fundamentally reformed, but still it can be it can be rendered effectively obsolete, you know, by the rest of culture. You know, people can lose their, uh, people can find more and more reasons to live successful lives in this world, and they can care less and less about paradise. Uh, and that can happen in every faith, and it, it could happen in Islam without the, the faith itself going away, you know, and that's, you know, that, that's what, I don't know what, I don't know what more we could hope for, right? If we, if, if we acknowledge that that's impossible, then we just have a, you know, I don't know what that, what tools, I mean, this is something I said to, to Majid at one point, I thought maybe pretending that the doctrine is more benign than it is, is actually a method of making it more benign in the end, right? Like if, if you just pretend hard enough and long enough over, over, you know, full generations, um, you, you actually, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling pretense and you know I don't, I don't know whether that's true or not but i i mean that's i think that's the thing we can we can hope to accomplish and i i don't know what to make of your 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 um case for for a war being possibly the you know the only the only um avenue left that that many iranians might yet support i mean it's just i i worry that the moment an actual you know a hot conflict started we'd have the same kind of tribal reaction it would just get framed as infidels against muslims you know the world over and you know western aggression or colonialism or something and and it would you know i'm, I'm sure there'd be people who would fit the description uh that, that you just laid out but i just um i just i think we would be perceived as as um infidel aggressors by most of you know, most of the Muslims worldwide. I mean, that's that's that would be my concern. So, yeah, I think you're probably right about that. But I think Iranians wouldn't be confused. Well, I just, I, I mean, I, again, I, I, I just, I find myself totally non-judgmental about how confused and desperate someone might be living under a regime like that, and then you add to that you know, prison state condition, yeah. bombs falling from your so-called allies that wind up creating a tremendous amount of collateral damage, right? I mean, just ju just what is the, what can we expect of someone who's, you know, whose family members just got killed by, by allied bombs? Um, how are they to, how are they going to do the moral math on that situation? And where will, where, where will their allegiances be after that? I just don't, I don't know what, one could hope for there. It's just a total catastrophe. Can I just add very quickly? Yeah, sorry to take yeah. up yeah, people's time. I, I I would say some. Yeah, absolutely. The the difference uh, for Iranians is that we have a recent memory of pre-Islam within our society, mm -hmm. and that pre that memory, even though for those of us who didn't live through it is a huge element of wanting this current regime to uh, cease to exist. And yes, that will come at a cost. And yes, if it is the US, although all of this is hypothetical, but if it is the US or some form of allied forces doing it, 
there would of course be a lot of tragedy but there would also be a lot of gratitude uh, from Iranians of course there's no perfect solution here and there would be immense tragedy mm -hmm. but overall and I, I I don't speak for all of Iranians of course I don't but that would be my guess hmm is it your perception that the sanctions regime has been viewed in that in that by that light? So the Iranians, <laughs> again, just speaking as a, 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 an individual, uh, the Iranians are probably the biggest lovers of the U.S. you will ever meet in your entire life. If you go to Iran hmm. and the, you say you're from the U.S., they love the U.S much because of how anti the current regime in Iran is. Now, it does that work itself into the sanctions. My impression, very limited, is that the sanctions don't really register on the average Iranians as much as everything else. That's sort of like on the mm. bottom of the list of all the pain and horror that they go through, that the mm. sanctions from the US is not on the radar. But again, just my impression, and I may be 100% wrong on that. Mm. Interesting. Well, thank you. Well, we have other Iranians on the call who will lift up their hands to uh, respond to that if they disagree with you, Amir. Uh, Tochi, you're next. Oh, hey, yes. Hey, Sam. What's up? Hey. Hey, man. Um, so my question is a little bit big picture. Um, you know, as somebody who is one of the most visible, you know, atheists on the planet, I would say. Um, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you feel that um, there's a concerted effort from sort of the atheist community in general to, um, you know, to educate, to create media, to really put the message out there? Because if I can just give a little bit of background, you know, I've been atheist for like 20 years. I remember the when Dawkins came on the scene and all that. And um, I, I do know it takes time, obviously, for the public to kind of understand humanism, non-belief, that whole thing. But I do kind of feel like the the wealthier atheists out here, I'm not sure like if they understand that they need to invest in creating content that can speak to people that can boil the ideas of things that you say that are very smart and intelligent into simple stories that people can understand and will then encourage them to actually um, have some free thought. You know, I, I think to myself of uh, media that I've seen, very few out of Japan that actually were the, the main characters atheists and it actually changed the way I look at the world. Um, mm -hmm. And also being in the film business, I know that Islamists are working their way into the film business. I deal with that literally every day mm. Um, mm. who are making content and trying to make it sexy, you know, to force a character to wear hijab and all that kind of stuff. And they are actively doing this. And I'm thinking to myself, where are the, you know, the atheist producers or again, not necessarily, it has to be 100% about atheists, but like, where are the free thought individuals in the world who do have the money to invest in creatives like myself, others, and not just me, obviously, but, um, do they think this stuff is important? I mean, do you come across um, people in your circle like that? And I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, I just wonder if that's a if that's a thing that um, kind of crosses people's minds, because I do think that there's some work to be done there to make it all easier mm -hmm. for everybody to um, to share this perspective, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's an inconvenient asymmetry here, which which I think I have felt more than most atheists, but I, I think many atheists feel this to some degree which is that atheism really isn't a thing right it's not it's not a philosophy it has no content it's just the rejection of of one extra god really i mean everyone's an atheist with respect to zeus and thor and all the other dead gods um but you know the difference with it with a so-called atheist is we just go one god further in rejecting the god of abraham and then we're done um but there's no um the, the impulse to define oneself in terms of that rejection, right? To, to, to pretend that this is a, some kind of life project to be an atheist is something that, um, 
you know, I've always felt and many people agree is, is just is ultimately unnecessary and deeply unattractive, right? I mean, to go to atheist conferences, to, to, to rally around this, this, the, the, the flag, the non-existent flag of atheism, um, as a political project, it just seems, um, kind of doomed. Uh, and yet we do need to resist the, the encroaches of theocracy wherever they become apparent. Right. But, and that, I mean, my argument has always been, we don't even need the concept of atheism to do that. We can just talk about science and reason and common sense and evidence and logic and all of those positive you know, intellectual virtues. Um, and also just to point out that the, 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 the incommensurable religious commitments of all these different religions are, 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 you know, can't all fit in on the same, uh, same page. Right. So it's just, there's, there's co conflict built into these religious commitments. And so secularism really is secularism. Many people confuse secularism with atheism as, as though we're a synonym, but secularism says nothing about a person's belief. It just, it's, it's just a commitment to keep religion out of politics and public life because it's irre religious differences are irreconcilable there. Right. Um, so, yeah, I just, um, I feel like, you know, the, the, the problem with most that, that, mo that many of, you know, many prominent atheists have found, you know, like you know, me and Dawkins and, and Dennett and others is that our atheism is really, is really felt as a, as a massive opportunity cost because it's not the thing we want to spend our time doing. You know, we have all, we have other things that we're positively interested in that we want to talk about, you know, whether it's in my case, I want to talk about, you know, the mind and moral philosophy and you know, the, the, the relationship between consciousness and the brain. And, and um, I mean, they're just things that I'm, that interest me. And, and yet, def and, def and defining oneself as an atheist is a little bit like defining oneself as a, like a non-astrologer, right? Like, like we don't need the concept of non-astrology. We just need to batter astrology whenever it becomes politically operative, right? So it's obvious we shouldn't be taking the positions of the stars into account when we're making important decisions or really any decisions, and we can easily disprove astrology. Um, so... And yet, the moment you saw astrology intruding into our politics, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see people spawn, you know, non-astrologer movements, right? I mean, we would just, we would just talk about the evidence or lack of evidence for these beliefs. So, um, I think, I think atheism will win, and certainly secularism will win. Not, I mean, I, I mean, and also, you know, I, I take your point about characters in 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 fiction and film, but I think there are lots of atheists characters it's just it's it's just that they're not um their atheism isn't i mean the the story is is rarely if ever about their atheism right i mean you just have you 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 have lots of characters who for, who clearly you know if you had to bet you you would know they were atheists whether they talked about it or not um and yet they're they're still noble and and uh worth rooting for um and there are many, you know, there are obviously many cases in which religion embarrasses itself in uh, fiction and film, um, and where religious intolerance is depicted. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, to, to, this is not not what you asked, but this is somehow, I think, relevant. I mean, one one thing that might have happened, he has asked if if you know anything good has if we've reached any kind of tipping point post October seventh. The one tipping point I think we might have reached is with the the identity politics on the left and you know wokeness and and the kind of the social justice hysteria, which has captured everything, because it clearly I mean it it can't really digest Islamism and and you know fidelity with with Hamas into itself without without you know uh, uh, truly. Uh, growing sick so uh, which is it's attempted to do um so i think we've probably hit peak woke you know i would i, I think that unless trump gets a second term uh in which case peak woke will be coming uh in a few years but um and that that would be a good thing because i do view that i mean the, the, so much of the confusion we're seeing now is in this conflation of anti-imperialism anti-whiteness anti, -imperialism, anti um 
affluence, you know, power is the, the people in power are always corrupt. You conflate all that with anti-Semitism, uh, and it's, it's brought us to this current moment where you have, you know, white kids and, you know, pampered white kids in Ivy League institutions, you know, essentially ready to don the hijab and and support Hamas. Um, yeah, I mean, that kind of impossible moral confusion uh, is only explained by that. And I think that that has to be unraveling. You know, Sam, if I can very briefly disagree, I, and I know I would so I can move sure. on and have other people speak. Um, I, I just res I agree with what you're saying on one hand, but on, on the other hand, I also feel that human beings at their core are emotional people. We're not rational people. And, um, you know, explaining things through science and logic obviously helps as, as a almost like as a backup. But there needs to be content that inspires people to want to emotionally be available to think to begin with. Um, and I think that's, in my honest opinion, something that perhaps the community can kind of look into. I, I like my final example on this, like one of the most profitable and biggest sort of fiction characters in Japan is uh, um, a full metal alchemist. I don't know if you've ever heard of this TV show. It's a very mm -hmm. famous TV show in Japan, very famous property. The main character is atheist. And it's literally mm -hmm. about how he's going through this sort of dark world. Um, and everyone around him is, attributes it to demons or creating all these problems, but he's like, no, 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 like there's something behind all this. Um, human be you know, human beings are made of very specific elements. This is not some mystical stuff. And lo and behold, it turns out in fact that it isn't something mystical. It is simply just someone um, who's who you manipulates religion essentially to control the masses and get what they want. So, and those kind of things I see online. I see people it draws them to wanting to actually think because mm -hmm. they've been entertained by a story that tells them, um, hey, you should kind of think for yourself because if you don't, people will think for you and will try to control you. And I think that's when someone like yourself steps in and says, oh, by the way, science and logic says this and that. But that, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I don't I don't disagree with that. And, I, you know, if, if someone created a compelling character in a, you know, huge mainstream movie franchise that was explicitly an atheist and made all kinds of great points without it being too heavy handed where it, where it detracted from the the actual entertainment value of the, of the film. And that's always the problem when you try to smuggle your, your political ideas into art, you know, it, 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 it often degrades the art, but it, insofar as you could have a really lovable character who was wise and obviously uh, an atheist, I think that would be all to the good. I mean, I think that would you know, that would be great. But I th I think it's the 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 truly low hanging fruit is to just show the dysfunction of religious dogmatism because that that's just so clear. I mean, and and if you look at a movie like, I mean, this was not you know such a big movie, but it was it was a good one. You look at a movie like Ho Hotel Mumbai, right, which has just showed the you know the the terrorist atrocities in in Bombay. Um committed by Lakshari Tai, but um, again, this is, this is, I reference this in one of my podcasts because it's, it's the perfect case of you can sort of see what jihadists are up to in a situation that had nothing to do with the West, nothing to do with America, nothing to do with Jews, uh, apart from the fact that they managed to find a synagogue in Mumbai and kill some Jews. Um, it's, uh, but you just watch a movie like that and there's just no way to come away. I mean, it, it, it is good art and it's, it's well done done but it's all you also come away with a with a um a really uncomfortable uh look at what true believers are capable of you know within islam right and 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 there's no there's no um uh exculpatory woke spin which which says oh it's not really it's not really their sincere religious beliefs that are leading them to to do this stuff it's something else right um, they were the victims of imperialism or whatever. Uh, no, it's just played very straight. This is just jihadist. This is the jihadist operating system in action. And, um, it's, you know, it, it, it discredits the jihadi project in the same way that every, you know, every good film about Nazis discredits Nazism, right? Without, without us, um, yeah, having to really define ourselves in opposition to it, but. Anyway, thanks for thanks for the question. Mars, you're next. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, Mr. Harris, a pleasure. 
Okay. Um, I had what I unceremoniously named the Ben Affleck effect happen to me in, but it wasn't in respect to Islam, but it was in respect to um, China. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, everyone knows this, there's, there's a noble predilection on the left to really protect minorities, but it, it comes along with this insane moral relativism that just excuses a lot of evil that would never happen within a Western sphere of influence. Um, your book you wrote almost 10 years ago, Beyond That, with The Moral Landscape, it's one of my favorite works. I It's made a strong impression on how I view morality, but it strikes me that the regressivism we're seeing just really validates most of the overall thesis. And um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that in the 21st century world, with the technology we have to it, it pretty much pits culture puts cultures so closely together that to keep a to maintain a mindset a worldview based on moral relativism is just incredibly dangerous we see what happens with islam but there are also a host of other fundamentalist religions out there that are probably just as dangerous um i wanted to ask you about the moral landscape because although it's been incredibly influential and it's something i still very much reference to the state it's just something i've never quite been able to um, convince myself of um, has your overall thesis or thoughts on that book changed and or um, over the last 10 plus years since you've written it has your have you been more convinced of the, the work in itself do you have better arguments for it now than you did have in the past i'm hoping for some yeah pointers there yeah actually i, th I think i'm going to release a um kind of an update on it yeah like a podcast version um my my thinking really hasn't changed except I've appreciated some of these stumbling blocks that that people ran into better now. Like I I was um there's some things I wished I had said in it because I didn't appreciate just how hung up people would would get on these particular points, uh, and they and they really you know some of them have just proved fatal for people on un, un, even understanding what I'm what I'm arguing for. Um. I mean, one is that there is a there's a tradition in in the in in kind of the Western philosophical approach to discussing morality and and, and its possible you know truth claims, um, which suggests that if there really is such a thing as moral truth, right, um, and it's not we're not just on some level of just kind of making it up to our preference to suit our preferences. Um, if there's anything like an objective morality, well then understanding what is true there has to be synonymous with being motivated to follow those truths and it has to be persuasive to others like so like if i could tell you that that you know doing x really is better it's been proven better to do x well that should motivate you know me at least to do x and it should probably persuade you to do x and if I'm fa if I if I'm not actually motivated to to be good in that way, and you're not persuaded to be good in that way, well, then this is a, somehow a failure of of the truth claims themselves. Like there really isn't a truth there, you know. And, and that and that so there's like a persuasion project and a and a um, a motivation project, which I've always viewed as separable, and which I think are separable. Uh, in the same way that I mean, the one example I'd give you is like, you know, let's say you want to lose weight. Right. And you actually, you know how to lose weight. You know, there's no uncertainty. You know that you need to eat less and exercise more and eventually you'll lose weight. And let's say there's no, let's say you're totally unconflicted about losing weight. You know, you'll, you know, you want to lose weight. You know, you'd be happier if you lost weight. You know, you won't regret losing weight. You're, you're completely aligned, you know, and, and there's no confusion about how to do it. Right. So there's a, there's a truth there that you could articulate about how to lose weight. And it's additionally true of you to say, that you want to be thinner, right? But it also happens, it's not the only thing you want. You also want to eat ice cream every day of the week, right? You, every day at six o'clock, what you really want to eat is ice cream. Um, and so you do that too. And magic, you know, as if by magic, you find yourself not losing weight. Um, and which is to say that, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not totally unified as a person, but that doesn't take away from the fact that we can still say that there are objective truths about diet and losing weight, and that they're real, you know. And um, I'm, so there, you know, in, in my view, there are objective moral truths. You know, some things just really are better than other things, 
whether or not any specific set of people can be motivated to move across the moral landscape toward those higher spots, right? Mm -hmm. The higher spots are no less real. Even if we're, you know, if we have weakness of will or we, you know, we're confused or we want other things or we don't know what we're missing or we have brain damage or what, you know, we, it's possible for all of us to just not, not get our act together. And it doesn't say anything about the actual landscape, you know, and about what's really possible. Um, but I just, I didn't really, I mean, people, a lot of people got really hung up on that and they just think that the fact that, I mean, you know, implicit in a lot of the, the resistance to the moral landscape is people want to, people don't want to be told that being good is hard or, or that it's rare or that it's, you know, or, or, and that would, that many people will fail to do it. And, um, it's, uh. And it might be harder than we want to admit, and rarer than we want to admit. And and the truth is, I, I think, I think we're all in the condition of not knowing what we're missing. Well, I mean, we're all in the condition of not knowing how much better life could be if we only got our act together, right? I just think it's like the how good could human life be? You know, it might. I think that I think the horizon of goodness might rec, you know recede past the point of our imagining. I mean, we like, it could just be unimaginably better than what we currently tend to experience. And we're just not, we, you know, we may not, we may, we, we may never get our head screwed on straight, you know, that, 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 but that doesn't suggest anything about the possible landscape that, that awaits us if we could get our head screwed on straight. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Hamid. Hamid Babaki. Hi. Hey. It's a true pleasure and honor to be with both of you, um, Yasmin and Sam, voices of reason and integrity. Um, I have a bunch of notes here. I try to make it uh, brief and simple. Um, I was just listening or watch or listening actually to um, yeah, interview with, with Roy Stewart and it was really frustrating. Mm. And more, it was frightening. Um, it's frightening how um, educated person, politician, um, justifies um, or minimize the atrocities. Atrocities are happening all over the world in in Islamic countries. Um, I just pointed one uh, case, which uh, he mentioned in an interview that. Islamic regime in Iran has not been performing Sharia law. This is not true. Mm. He doesn't. Mm. He's ignorant, right? I've lived half of my life in Iran. They did so, and they're doing so. The only right. reason they couldn't do it widespread, Sam, is there was a huge backlash. So Iranian people are different. As you mentioned, there is a huge gap between the Islamic government and and people in Iran. So they couldn't really do it. They started the stoning women for adultery. They cut the hands of the, the thieves. Mm. They uh, they killed hang people for drinking and, and et cetera, and et cetera. And they, they killed thousands of people as probably you know about it. So yes, they did perform Sharia law. Right. Girls of nine, eight years are, you know, are, could get married and the law you know, uh, support that. So anyway, he, he's ignorant. He doesn't know. Mm. Um, but uh, the other uh, comment and, and the question that I have is, um, I think what is happening in Gaza and Israel um, and also in Ukraine is part of, um, well, Douglas Mary call it uh, the war in the West. I call it the war on civilization, democracy, liberalism, and human rights. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, West is the main part of it, for sure. Um, and the fact is, Islamic um, or jihadist, um, Islamic regimes, they're a big part of it. And unfortunately, there is a, um, uh, there is a, a coordination or unity between Islamists and left, as you know well, better than me, but my question is, there's also a third group um, I have around myself 
and relatives, etc. There's a younger generation that uh, they're naive and they just they hear the news, they watch, you know, the scenes here or there, and they have become part of this campaign, this anti liberal anti-democracy campaign. Um, and, it, you know, uh, I think uh, for liberals and, and, and left-wing people, it's ideology. You can uh, explain that that way. Um, for Islamists, it's especially the jihadists and fanatic Islamists, it, it's, it's clear. Of course, as you said, it's not easy to uh, change their mind. But this young generation, is something that worries me. And you they see all this stuff in TikTok and etc. And um I, I'm not sure how um should we deal with that. Uh, it's mm. I think this is um uh this is a seem to be a losing battle between that camp and the camp of humanity and liberalism. And now this young generation has become unfortunately part of that. Yeah. I hope you have a question. Do you have an answer yeah. to that? Thank you. Yeah, well, no, I share your concern. I mean, I, I see it in reflected in my daughter's schools. I mean, I, I know what the kinds of things their friends believe. Um, it's it's quite scary. It's just a, a massive amount of misinformation. And again, there, there's a there's a moral operating system, a political moral operating system on the left that's getting hacked by by Islamists, you know, I think quite consciously, um, and it's it's this you know, it's, it's a cons it's a very Western and you know, in many cases very American concern about social justice and racism and um, the projection of Western power where it doesn't belong, right? Like kind of a Noam, Noam Chomsky ish cr critique of American foreign policy. All of this gets wrapped up into this into this bias um which um bends over backwards to excuse even atrocities when perpetrated by uh you know overtly terroristic organizations in the muslim world like hamas right so i guess it's just it's see it would seem impossible to successfully uh, be taken in by apologists for for these kinds of atrocities, but it, it, you know it, it it's happened and it's, and it's happening. And yeah, I just I think eventually this just the the moral confusion has to be spelled out clearly enough. The double standards, the unten the untenability of the double standards have to be spelled out has to be spelled out clearly enough that um, that it becomes, you know, untenable, but it's, it, but there's a level of masochism here in the West among liberals that is, it's impo really impossible to exaggerate. I mean, there was a, there was this case that, I mean, it just seemed like a, a grotesque Babylon B joke, you know, it just, it just seemed impossible, but it seemed to be in fact real. There was a case, you know, I think it was in 2015 when the, when the, um, the refugee, issue in Western Europe was at its height and, you know, Germany had just admitted uh, you know, over a million refugees, I think. And there was, you know, signs of misogyny and crime and sexual assaults occurring. And I mean, there was a, there was a case of a, a German woman who got raped by uh, you know, Muslim immigrants of some kind. Uh, and she claimed her attackers were German nationals because she didn't want to be perceived as racist, right? I mean, like that's the level. Yeah, you know, just imagine the psychology of a person who would who would uh, whose political correctness would get the better of them, even in the aftermath of a of a of what I I, I seem to remember is a was a gang rape, right? I mean, it's just it seems impossible. But they, but there, there are all these scandals that have this shape you know in western countries you got the the rotherham you know grooming gang scandal and the rochdale grooming gang s scandal in the uk right where i mean it just sounds it, these don't, don't even sound like facts when i state them but you know i've checked the articles and uh, in the bbc and elsewhere and these seem to be facts that you know over a thousand british girls underage british girls were 
trafficked and gang raped and by by all you know almost entirely um you know pakistani men uh, um and for over a decade and their their parents would show up at the police station complaining about the the rape and abuse of their daughters and the, these these crimes went uninvestigated because the the police were afraid of being called racist um what do you do with that that's just there's got to be some place to, to where we can reboot civilization from here. But that's you, I, I, until that happens, you have to keep shining a light on this these insane double standards that that creep up. Or if you've just reversed the races of the people involved, or the ethnicities of the people involved, or the tribal identities of the people involved, everyone would see clearly all of a sudden. And yet you you run them the other way, and everyone's confused, or nearly everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you. Just yeah. a closing comment. Today's Women's International, International Day, and I'd like to remind uh, brave and fearless women in Iran, they have shaken the ground under the Islamic regime. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, around the world people pay more attention to Iran and the women in Iran. I would say yeah. Islamic regime is the weakest link in the, uh, in the camp of the Islamists. And I hope this, you know, as it got strengthened after, you know, 1979, after the Islamic regime came to power, it happens on the opposite side too, by overthrowing that government. Thank you. Nice, nice, thank you. Sam, I'm noticing the time now, and I asked you for two hours of your time, and I've already taken more than that. Um, yeah, so I just- that, That's okay. I'm you're okay. okay you're, yeah, we, yeah, we, we can bring bring this to, uh, this into a landing whenever you want. So, as all right. Well, thank you, thank you so yeah. much, um, Anya. Then you lucky girl, you get to ask Sam your question. I am. I am a huge admirer of both of you. I almost pinch myself that I have this chance to listen to your conversation. Just thank you so much. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Sam. I have a question for you. I want to take you back to your interviewing Danny Kahneman in New York, probably mm -hmm. 2018 or 19. It was great conversation. And uh, towards the end of it, and Danny is not super verbose, you know, he tends to give no. short answers and you kind of was, you were teasing more of a conversationalist out of him. And um, then you ask him a question. So, Danny, are you optimistic? Do you have any hope for the humanity? And he gave you an answer, no, just one word. Mm -hmm. And it was Perfect. a very <laughs> loaded pause there. Uh -huh. And then you engaged him in a discussion of one of your favorite topics, incentives, don't you think? So whatever the matter of the conversation or arguments he put forward to convince him otherwise. I think what struck me was your unbeatable sense of optimism. And even if we don't see a solution today, we might see it tomorrow. And mm -hmm. it very much appeals to me and appealed to me then. And now, given everything that happened and everything that was discussed today, I look back at that and I have this feeling of good old times um though it was not uh so what is your sense today are you optimistic are you feeling more like danny mm. uh what what's your sense well, today pe people rarely accuse me of being optimistic i must say that's not well i do <laughs> i know i know this i'm happy i'm happy to have appeared that way uh if only for that moment but um i mean it, I don't really I, I don't think in terms of optimism and pessimism much. I mean, I you know, I, I'm there are many things that worry me, but I'm also I mean, one, I'm also just I'm I'm happy, right? So like despite the fact that I spend a lot of time focusing on the dark side of of you know human misadventure, I, I actually, you know, I'm living a very rewarding life. And so I'm you know, it's it's you know there's a lot I want to protect just personally, just because I know how good life can be. And um, when I see people, you know, needlessly screwing up their lives and the lives of others, it just, it, it, 
bothers me and it worries me. But um, I guess I'm, you know, I'm optimistic in the sense that everything we're talking about, I mean, none of, virtually none of it is the result of unchangeable characteristics in any group of people, right? We're not talking about, you know, there's so many psychopaths who in the Muslim world, right? Islam just has more than its fair share of psychopaths and there's nothing we can do about them because they, they've got brain damage and they're just, they're, they're going to create all kinds of harm whenever they're given the chance, no matter what we say and no matter what we do. No, we're, we're talking about the, we're talking about ideas. We're talking about the power of ideas and ideas are almost nothing, right? I mean, they're, they're effectively everything when, when they're operative, but when you actually look at them, and when you look how look at how vulnerable they are to disconfirmation and and embarrassment and challenge, it's just they're they're not even tissue thin, right? I mean, the idea that the Quran is perfect in every syllable is I mean, it's just it's so obviously wrong, right? And, and the same can be said about the Bible. Um, it's just so they're. In any given moment, it, it, it should be possible to persuade people that, that there, there are much better ways to think and live, right? And so, and, and we get a fresh chance at that with every new generation, right? Because no one is born into this world with their heads full of bad ideas, right? The bad ideas get delivered to them by their parents and their community and their wider culture. So insofar as we can change culture as a kind of operating system, that that's you know running on top of you know all the the currently available human minds well then then we we have to keep doing that and and i i'm aware of how quickly that can happen for good and for ill i mean i'm so i'm you know i'm i'm op i'm optimistic and pessimistic by turns knowing that just 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 how quickly ideas can spread and become operative right and become irresistible to lots of people um you know, it's just like, I mean, like you know, the, a recent success in in the American context was just in change of in the change of attitude around gay marriage, right? Like, like there was there was like one week where that seemed impossible, and the next week it was accomplished. I mean, it was it was almost overnight what happened there. Um, and you get the sense that even the fundamentalist Christians in America aren't spending much time trying to win that win back that particular battle right i mean i'm sure there are some but oh, they it's like i'm not i mean they're not they're not it's like that having lost that battle isn't even that big a deal for the people who are most concerned about it you know um in the end so i, I don't know i mean i just i'm i'm mindful of the possibility that things can change very very quickly because there's there's no substance to the the thoughts that are hold that are holding all of this in place. Thank so, you, Sam. Yeah. Now we give up. Three. Yeah. Thank you. We still have a bunch of people with their hands up. So, um, just being respectful of Sam's time, if I could please ask you to get directly to the question, um, Nirvan, you're next. That already made me feel nervous. I just wanted to thank yeah. <laughs> uh, you for on. all that he's done, and I wouldn't have got this opportunity to thank him otherwise. Uh -huh. So thank you so much, uh, Sam. This is a fanboy moment right now. Yeah, nice. And well, you once you. said, you know, that uh, some people have the personality that completely destroys the limbic system. That's what's yeah. happening right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know your thoughts on Sadhguru, you know, from coming from India. Uh-huh. So I oh, just wanted so, to so, so, Sadhguru. Uh, um, I don't actually know him. I haven't really engaged with him. I haven't engaged engaged with him directly, and I haven't engaged with his his work much. So, um, you're talking about Sadhguru, the the, the current, the prominent. Yeah, guru. he does yeah, yeah. sound like Deepak Chopra and Beard sometimes. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So I haven't I haven't spent enough time. I mean, he actually. I think he plays golf. I think he 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 wanted to play golf with me. I think that if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think he's a golfing guru, and he wanted I, someone on his team tried to get me to go on a golf course with him. Um, I play golf like once a year, and then somehow they heard that, and and uh, um, but we did not play golf, and I have not crossed paths with him. So I, I I'm I'm reluctant to cast judgment one way or the other. I mean, I'm I'm sure there's stuff I disagree with him about, 
where you know meditation and 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 you know introspection brush up against third person science and claims about the universe i mean he i, I think he's probably more like deepak chopra than i anyone should want to be in terms of making claims about you know the you know, what you experience with your eyes closed in meditation can tell you something about cosmology or what happened before the big bang or you know so i, I just don't think that that runs through but i i I have to plead ignorance on him specifically. Well, no, yeah. thank you. Namaste. Yeah. The beer yeah. is going to taste different Namaste. after talking to you today. Thank you yeah. so much. Nice to meet you. Nilu Far. Uh, hi. Hi, Sam. Hi, Yasmin. Hi. It's uh, very, I really appreciate this moment right now. I'm an ex Muslim from Iran. Uh, I live in Canada currently. Uh, so, I do all the best I can to raise the voices like yours because I feel like as an ex-Muslim in Canada, like this relates to my question, so I'll get to it. Uh, for example, in campus and university, I go around, I see um, people with um, not just like their appearance or anything, that, that they seem close to the ide ideologies of the Islamic Islamic Republic or those that um, blindly uh, support the Islamic uh, ideology, it, it, whether they know they're doing it or whether they're doing it indirectly. And I feel uh, so um, uh, weak. I feel like I, 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 I don't know what I should do in response. I would, I would like other than uh, raise like empowering your voices like yours and Yasmin and like and others I don't know what I can do personally to to address um these supporters these people that um uh especially those that are like have the same or like have close systematic beliefs as the Islamic Republic or or rather they ignore it or uh, they feel like they they're better off not thinking about what's happening in their own country uh i um uh, i want to find a way uh to not be silent for them and i also mm -hmm. want to find a way that even if this is a free like this is a country of freedom of uh speech um is um of course promoted but um uh, but still when when that kind of dialogue is being um used uh, like pro uh, like islam like or like islamist dialogue that's threatening that 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 mm -hmm. scares me so i want to like reach out to the university and be like these people that are gathering here uh yes uh, on the surface you see they're like uh, advocating for um, innocent lives being taken in palestine but on the inside do you know like what that roots to but of course like no one's gonna hear me and i'm gonna be banned for like disrespecting or islamophobia or whatever i just don't mm -hmm. know how I should approach this without um, like essentially ruining my career or like my university life, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, first I just want to acknowledge it's a hard problem and I, I don't really have a, a formula, you know, for, that can help you decide, you know, which battles to fight. Right. I mean, you, you can be, um, you know, it makes it depending on what your actual context is and and your your personal vulnerability, you know, professionally and and otherwise, um, it can make sense to pick your battles, right? And to just to to avoid conflict where you can avoid it, and to um, you know, to to remain silent when even when it's uncomfortable. And in other moments, you know, to, you know, anonymously uh, publish things or to actually, you know, stick your head up above the parapet and and um, at whatever risk and and um, make noise. You know, it's, it's it's I think these institutions, I mean, any, you know, any Western university, say, has a responsibility to not be confused about all of these issues. Right. So if people are protesting in support of, you know, pa Palestine, uh, that may be one thing. But if there are if there are parts of that protest 
or things articulated in that protest that are synonymous with support for Hamas or support for genocide or support for having everyone in the West, uh, you know, in Vancouver or wherever you happen to be to live under Sharia law, right? That's another thing. And and it, it, the administration at a university should be made aware of those distinctions and be made uncomfortable by them, right? So, you know, I, insofar as you're, you belong to any institution, I think, you know, you have an expertise that that can be helpful. And again, even if you deliver that behind closed doors to people in power, you know, that could be worth doing. But I, you know, everyone has to assess just what sort of sacrifices they want to make personally to engage this war of ideas. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't think that everyone needs to do what I do um, mm -hmm. and, or what, what Yaz does. Um, it comes with a lot of hassle and you just, you need to be aware of those hassles. And, and, you know, those of us who are doing this, uh, you know, are, um, I mean, we're very impatient with some people who should know better and have a, I, you know, we view as ha having a public responsibility not to be confused, but I, I don't find myself at all impatient with, you know, people who are, um, who are trying to navigate these moments the way you are. I mean, so I, again, I see uh, my daughter, my, my, I have a high school age daughter who's in substantially this situation, right? She's surrounded by moral imbeciles, right? Who are, are totally confused about what's really going on in the world. And for her to be unconfused in that situation publicly would be to be branded a bigot by many people, right? And so it's just, it's just not a, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not pushing her to sound like me in those situations, even though I, in many of those situations, I think she should think like me. And I, you know, I try to equip her with with you know, the best arguments uh, that I can give her, um, it's a very uncomfortable situation. And, and I just, you know, it's, you, you can only shoulder what you can shoulder at the time. Yeah, that is right. Thank you. Um, I, I really commend uh, like you and all of those are brave enough to do this publicly. Like I have a like small public Instagram page and even posting there is very stressful. Yeah. Uh, but what you guys Instagram do, is a mess. I, I, I don't even look at Instagram. So. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes it's the only way to get through your message to the ordinary people yeah, around you. No doubt. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just add really quickly before we move on to the next person that um, I think uh, Sam's advice was perfect. You definitely go behind closed doors and share your perspective. But even if you are in a class discussion or with peers, if you start to speak up, you'll notice that a lot of people are going to agree with you. And they were just waiting for somebody to have the courage to be the first person to say it. Um, so there's probably yeah. a lot more people that are your allies, you know, amongst your peers than you think. Um, it's just a, in Canada, especially, it's very, it's very dangerous to speak up these days. Uh, Cindy, you're next. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say real quickly, thank you so much, Yasmin, for for hosting this and and Sam for, I know you said that you're not usually perceived as being very optimistic, but you're mm -hmm. actually, you know, participating in talks like this really is making me feel just that much more optimistic. Oh, nice. um, yeah, so I really appreciate that. And I'll try to make this quick, but I have kind of um, two related questions. You know, I heard you say on a couple of occasions that this has not, that, you know, jihad and, and certain actions have nothing to do with Jews. And while that's probably true <clears throat> on a certain level, I, I just I wanted to know how much you think um if anti-Semitism is actually anti-Jew from a, a religious standpoint um, versus anti-Zionism. And the way that I mean Zionism is as Israel as an independent state, which mm. I believe is, is, is a threat to Islamism because it's, you know, it represents a group of people that are not subjected to Sharia law, that are, are not dhimmi, 
And especially when Israel is supported by the United States, which is the, the head of essentially of the Christian world, the Western world, um, you know, it, it seems like Israel really is a big piece of this because if Israel falls, it's then the Muslim world against the Christian world. So that that's, you know, so I want to know how you distinguish that. And then as somebody that lives in the West, I live in California, I'm wondering how do you address what is essentially Islamist anti-Zionism um, in the West? Because I, I feel like there is so much propaganda and there's so much of an attempt now to separate, you know, saying, well, it's okay to be Jewish, but it's not okay to be Zionist. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to even get into, you know, the specific Israeli government right now, which I completely disagree with. Um, yeah. But, but you know, I, and like you said earlier, I feel like in, you know, in a real, in, in, a, in a perfect world, I think it wouldn't matter what your religion, your culture, your background, you know, we should all be able to live wherever we want to and and have, you know, and, and basically get along. But in, in a world where there is such um, virulent anti-Semitism, you know, from a specifically Islam, Islamist perspective, I, I I just don't think that that's really unrealistic. What am I trying to say? I, I think it's not really realistic. Mm -hmm to say that we can't have Israel as a Jewish state. I think that would be really, really a threatening thing right now. Yeah, you know. no, I, I agree with, and um, yeah, I mean, I just think that given the nature of anti-Semitism, uh, Israel is is a, as a Jewish state is, is probably a moral necessity, um, but I view that as a bad thing. Right. Give it, I mean, it's, it's really only because of the history of anti-Semitism that that makes any moral sense to me. I just I think we we should get out of the religion business or just across the board. Um, and so certainly with, for, for the purposes of our politics and our our nationhood and and. Um, but not yet, I guess, in the case of Israel. Um, I mean, I think you can you can separate anti-Semitism and, and anti-Zionism. To some degree, I used to think you could really separate them cleanly, but you know, post October seventh, I just you know, practically speaking, I, I don't see them as that separable because, you know, most of the people, most of the time, who are anti-Zionist, I perceive to be anti-Semitic too. Um, but I would I would agree that at least in principle they can be separated, and you can certainly separate a anti-Semitism from a criticism of the Israeli government, as you just showed. I mean, I you know I'm. I, I think it's just obvious that the there are many people in the Israeli government who, who shouldn't be in the government, and uh, it's a disaster, and the settlements are a disaster, and the the um, well, the I, I think to, they're trying to to be like the you know um, sort of a version of you know a a Judaic version of an Islamist regime right. in a way. So yeah. yeah, well, and insofar as that's true. The moral difference between the two sides in this conflict begins to erode. I mean, so it's just a matter of degree. I mean, I think there's, you know, in the aggregate, if you just look at Israeli society and and you know Jewish culture worldwide, you know, they're nothing like jihadists or Islamists. But you know, in, but if they, if Israel were more and more extreme and more and more had more and more of the character ultra orthodox and and the and the most rabid settlers um and you found more and more people who were you know advocating uh eradicating the palestinians right if that weren't if those people weren't outliers but they were kind of a mainstream voice well then the difference between the two sides would be would be less and less detectable and i would care less and less about who won right i mean and and if you truly equalize them i can honestly say my identity as a Jew would mean nothing, right? It would just it, it would just be I can't pick between these two sides because they're both barbaric and they're both committed to further barbarism and they're both impressively addled by you know completely deranged religious ideas uh, for which there is no evidence, right? So, um, but there is a you know as things stand, most of those extremes are are really outlier cases among the Israelis, again, as bad as the government 
is and you know with specific people um and so i do perceive a a, a big moral difference between you know i, I mean it, 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 everything boils down for me and this is why yeah this is why jay's disagreement with me is something that i i really i can't interact with because he seems to imagine that I've made all kinds of historical errors in my analysis of the, of the situation. Um, I think without ever pointing out what those errors are, but uh, the truth is, my analysis and my my convictions here have virtually nothing to do with my reading of of the history. Right? I, I don't I simply don't care about the history, and I think we should we shouldn't care about the history. What we should care about is what people are committed to doing now. And what they would do if they had the power to do it, right? And we know we know what those disparities are. We know that we know what the Israelis would do if they could do more or less everything they want, because they can do more or less everything they want. You know, if 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 the IDF wanted to perpetrate a, a real genocide, it could do that. Um, it's pretty clear that if the, if Hamas uh, could perpetrate a genocide, they would. I mean, they really showed us on October seventh what they are, were inclined to do when they had the, the run of the place. And um, there's just a massive asymmetry there. I mean, this is the line that many of us have used, and I think it's it, it's morally decisive. And it, it sounds like a cartoon, but it's just true that if, you know, if, if um, the Palestinians laid down their weapons, there would be peace. There would be a two-state solution. There would have been a two-state solution 50 years ago. If the Israelis laid down their weapons, there would be a genocide. Right. I think that is the only moral analysis you need of the current situation. You don't have to know anything about the history. You just have to know what people would do, albeit based on their their what they imagine to be the history. Um, you have to know what they would do if they had the power to do it. And, that, and I think we know everything we need to know about that situation. Um, and if something changes and the Israelis become truly genocidal, well, then I would react to that. But that's just not the situation we're in. And you know, a lot of people in the West appear to be confused about it, and Islamists are trying to leverage that confusion. Uh, you know, it's, that part is clear. And that's a high hypothetical, but, you know, expanding upon that realistically, we have, and again, you're the one who brought this up, um, that quite often Palestinians will put their children in the front lines knowing that it's going to make Israeli soldiers put down their weapons, but yeah. flip that script around and imagine if Israelis thought that they would protect themselves by putting a child yeah. Yeah. in their front of children. them, like as if yeah. it would make a difference. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we saw on October 7th, what they were doing to children. So yeah, yeah it's, it's um, the truth is out there. Like it's already obvious for everyone to see. Yeah. Okay, we have six more people, and I s promised myself I was going to end this um, half an hour ago. <laughs> so let's be very, very, very quick with our questions, please. Liv Cole, I feel bad hanging out because I know this is like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to speak to Sam Harris directly, and I don't want to ruin that for you. No, Go sorry, ahead. I should put my name properly. It's yeah. Liv Klinger. Uh, yeah. Sam, I have a question about Islamic uh, extremism and terrorism in Europe. So there are so many cases of terrorism growing, sexual violence, lack of social cohesion, so, uh, social trust. And yet when you pointed out, as you've talked about to people, mm -hmm. they, especially the left who've captured our media, our institutions, our education, they refuse to recognize any, any of it. And you're called the bigot. So despite reality sort of staring them in the face, you can't argue with facts. It feels like we're we have to act now because there's also the issue of like falling birth rates in Europe and immigrant communities growing and like the sort of the culture clashes that will get even worse. Uh, mm. But it's hard to see how we can how, how we can do anything when people won't listen to facts. Yeah, no, I I think it it's um, it really really worries me that we we. Um, the obvious is so difficult to point out and and argue for. I mean, it's and this has been now going on for decades, right? And and I, I think, um, 
I mean, there, there are moments where this this become the untenability of this becomes especially clear. I mean, October seventh is is one of those moments, and then I guess the clarity you know begins to recede. Um, but there'll be other moments. I mean, there will be you know some awful case of something happening in you know one of the capitals of Europe, whether it's a terrorist atrocity or you know some uh, so called grooming scandal or and. I just uh, those moments need to be seized upon, you know, journalistically and and politically to to make the case. Right. And we just have to become more and more impatient with the people who won't see the people, especially the people who are in positions of responsibility, who just w won't see the double standards that they're applying to try to make this fit with the general picture of how life should be lived in 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 open societies, right? I mean, it's just, on some level, we, 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 we have to make it, you know, indelible that tolerance of intolerance is cowardice. You know, it's just, it's just like, the, the, we're, we're, we're faced with a lot of cowardice, moral cowardice on the part of our leaders. I mean, they're, they're so scared of something that's gonna be said about them on Twitter that, they just acquiesce to, again, so, something that they would be unthinkable if you just changed the the ethnic or or religious identities of the people involved. I mean, th th I mean, this happens in America, you know, uh, you know, in the social justice space, you know, in in cases totally unrelated to religion. Um, and I mean, I just you know, it's just it's just an interesting thought exercise, and it should be pointed out to people. If if you don't, if you hear about an act of violence. I mean, you hear about something that happens on a subway where somebody winds up getting killed, and you hear about what you know what people were doing and how they were behaving up you know up to to and through the incident, and what you know what innocent bystanders were doing, and what was what was said and what was done. You have all the facts, and if you don't know how you feel about that situation until you learn the races of the people involved. I would argue that there's something wrong with you, right? I mean, that's just that's just not the kind of person you want to be, right? Like there, there, there's, there are situations that can be described exhaustively where you know everything you need to know to understand who was right and who was wrong and who was good and who was evil. And if if you can't do any of that moral math until you find out the color of somebody's skin, you you're the problem, right? And I mean, and that so that's just to take the become kind of the American social justice racial politics case. But and so we have to outgrow that and and we have to outgrow it with respect to religious and ethnic identities too in, in Europe and elsewhere. So um but yeah I mean it's just we have to keep arguing the case and I mean ultimately I mean again the, the thing that I worry about is that well intentioned liberal people will fail and fail and fail again until It'll become truly unendurable, and then we'll have the the rise of the right. You know, I mean, then you'll have Christian fascists who will say, "Okay, we're we're going to sort this out for you. You, you. you libtards couldn't figure this out. Um, you know, we know how to secure borders, and we know how to make sure uh, the trains run on time." And I worry about that. I worry, you know, nothing's going to empower the right better than leftist confusion on the on this topic can i just add and something jew, we're, yeah sorry and, just, we're, saying, and as yeah. a jew and an ex-muslim like we're both screwed either way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no we're just we're, we're already seeing like a lot of far-right parties rise in europe because the mainstream can't talk about it so it's just it feels like yeah. there's something really urgent to be done but then you mentioned your daughter. It feels like the kids here at TikTok is really like blowing their minds. Uh, so it's just hard to see when the new generation also seems to be indoctrinated with this ideology, how you then move out. I hear you. We need to keep talking, even though it's scary on a personal level, but it it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I know, but onward. You would know. All right, Brandon. Hey, thanks to both of you. I uh, really always appreciate everything you guys do. I'll <clears throat> try and keep this quick. Uh, Sam, I'm a huge fan. You can see I'm wearing my uh, waking up shirt. Oh, nice. Uh, 
And believe me, I, I'd rather we didn't have to deal with this kind of bullshit and that we could all just be, you know, we'd be talking for about meditation for a few hours instead. Right. And before I get to my main point, I would just like to say, uh, hopefully one day you get to finish your re-recording of your end of faith. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Hopefully one day, because it's always great in the author's voice. Um, I don't have much to add on. I know this has mostly been about Islam and Israel and all that. I don't have much to add. Um because honestly it, it just seems so hopeless until like we find like another planet to escape to like i don't even know what we could possibly do i'm an atheist jew um i've been an atheist since i was three years old so i've always tried to not be jewish i just want to be brandon um october changed it kind of a bit as i'm sure it did for a lot of people but like i said i don't have too much to add on that topic um because you guys have all covered it beautifully um I always tried to be a centrist, um, as I'm sure most people here are. And there's a lot about the far left that bothers me. And obviously, you know, the modern right and Trumpism and all that. Like, I'm basically in line with your views. And I find it so hard to, like, how to balance these things. And obviously, since October the 7th, my leftism has been kind of pushed to the side because there's a lot of stupidity coming from the left mm. but i'm so worried about for example the right weaponizing that so for example i'm in canada do i love everything trudeau does no do i love everything biden says no do am i sick of some of like the gender stuff sure there's garbage on both sides but i worry that people are just trying to like weaponize one thing over the other and i don't know how to like I don't know how to keep a balance because yes, extreme Islamism could be the worst possible outcome that we could all end up with. But like, I also don't want the Christian right to take over and I don't want anti-vaccine bullshit to take over and I don't want Trumpism to take over. And so I, I don't even know if I have a question It just okay. how do we find a balance here? Because it's like, I see everyone saying, Oh, this is the less problem. This is the less problem. And I disagree with some of the stuff that's been even said in the chat here. Everything is, woke 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 and i agree with some of it but it's like i don't know both well, sides of yeah. people. I don't I know know, what on, on this particular issue the, the the moral confusion is disproportionately on the left but that, that's just not the only problem in the world there, there's the problem of the of the right and the and the, certainly the far right and i think you just need to be able to keep both grotesque objects in view at the same time and many people can't manage that. Many people who find uh, the, the problem of leftist moral confusion to be the, you know, the bright, shiny object they can't ignore, they focus on that to the exclusion of everything else, right? And, you know, and for those people, you know, I've got Trump derangement syndrome and, and you know, I'm, I'm uh, not really a, a, as reliable an ally as they would want. Um, but I just, you know, I think we can we can there's just no reason to be confused about the the excesses of dogmatism and and uh identity politics as you push leftward or rightward on the political spectrum and there there are ways in which this the spectrum isn't even isn't even uh, linear anymore it's just i mean there's just so much there's so many ways to be wrong and crazy at the at this moment that um you just have to honestly point out errors wherever you see them and wherever they're consequential and and so i i think we all we have a duty to be uh, you know morally and intellectually honest and we have a duty to be non not tribal in any important sense um and so you know when when the americans are wrong as an american i should be quick to see that when the jews are wrong i should as a jew i should be quick to see that when the white guys are wrong, as a white guy, I should be quick to see that. I mean, so it's, it's like there's no reason to have let your identity get in the way of, of seeing, you know, mistakes. And um, yeah, so yeah, my answer to my, my answer really is just that there's there, there isn't it shouldn't be difficult to see what's wrong on the far left and the far right simultaneously, and yet it is in fact true to say that many people seem to find it difficult. Yeah, for sure. I guess my struggle is when I see people say, "Oh." you know, you're anti-Israel, you're pro-Palestine, and that, oh, this is what the left is doing to us, or this is what the right, I just try and say, like, 
why do we have to connect that? That's not a left issue. It's not a right issue. Like, it's just like, I agree with you, but I mm -hmm. just find it impossible to avoid the continued polarization of the two sides. And like, it's just sometimes yeah. hard to wake up in the morning. And, well, and I just, I mean, there are, we have to admit that there are situations where that are essentially you're confronted with something like a moral emergency or a political one. And, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend principle just snaps into place. And you then, then again, this is what I worry about. I worry about societies that can't, where the, where the secularists and the real liberals are, are so brain dead on the, on the issues we've been talking about here that, uh, suddenly they wake up one day and we, and they realize, all right, only the, the, the fascists or quasi fascists or the Christian theocrats among them are the people who can really, you know, land this plane now. Right. I mean, we're just, this is, this is a true emergency. And, you know, insofar as that can happen in Western Europe or in America, I, I think it's really worth worrying about. I mean, we just, we don't want that you know, we don't want that a pendulum swing back into, you know, right wing authoritarianism. And I, I can really, I mean, this is the perfect recipe for that. If we, if we can't get normal secular centrists and liberals to uh, make sense on this, on this particular issue. We, for sure. I'll just end on this topic, on this comment that totally agree. And I just think we all need to like, we need to take back the label and, instead of always being like it's the left the left we can say no we are the true left the, we are the classical liberals you're some kind of new crazy and stop taking our label mm -hmm. because the world thinks it's a liberal pro libtard problem but no like liberalism is a good thing and just we need to resist right. taking our label yeah yeah thank you both very Thanks. much so we'll take one last question um we've got daniel Elnaz, Sarah, said, oh no, more people are raising their hands. <laughs> uh, so which one of you guys has a very specific question for Dan? For, for Dan, who the hell is Dan? Where did that come from? <laughs> there, there is a Dan Oh, because I'm looking at Dan, I'm reading your name, yeah, Daniel yeah. Smith. Oh, and there's two Dans that I'm looking at right now. Um, has a question for Sam that is specific, something that we haven't uh, touched on before. And I'll let you guys fight it out. Well, I, I think my question is not specific enough. So let me just thank um, thank you for and the end of faith uh, changed my life, and okay. thank you for being still being here. I think you are the last uh, horseman standing riding. So thank you so much. Uh, well, yeah. no, well, there, there are two at least two are still riding, but uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also had a comment. I can't forfeit yeah. you. <laughs> I was answering, I was had answer to his question, so I can also forfeit. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, you said forfeit. Oh, I missed it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sarah. My question is a little more for Yasmin, oh. so I'm not sure if I okay. should ask it. Yeah. <laughs> There's two Sarahs. I messed up. Okay, yeah, oh. go ahead, Sarah. I, well, my question is about information hedging when there's like a lot of misinformation or double speak or things like this going on but I also maybe someone has a more Sam Harris question yeah <laughs> you can talk to me next week hmm. other Sarah okay. <laughs> hi happy international women's day yes hi Sam hi. it's a pleasure talking to you uh mm -hmm. question I have is you talked about and I'm trying to be <laughs> very quick about this. So uh, you talked about the fact that you get silenced as a white man, as a Jewish, non-Muslim, not very, not fluent at all in Arabic. You get told that you should not talk about these topics. And you said that women like Yasmin should speak up more. 100% agree. Her speaking up has had a domino effect on so many of us mm. speaking <laughs> up as well. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate what you have done in order to encourage her to do that. But Yasmin had a book and her book was not published for two years. And it ended up being you and her husband actually doing the work to get it, to get her to self-publish because she was so 
discouraged for the whole like think mm -hmm. about that somebody who is so active out there in the media i've been talking for the past year and a half mostly due to what yasmin has done for us and sort of uh, as well for whatever happened in iran with women life freedom movement massage in armenia got it getting murdered and all of that and for the past year and a half i've received every kind of insult uh silencing tactics gaslighting whatever uh -huh. you can up. and i'm an ex-muslim coming from iran i'm a woman i'm fluent not in arabic but in quran so i understand the topic i understand what i'm talking about but i get still silenced all the time and it's not just by the muslims it's by the left westerner woke liberal progressive that cannot understand the idea of me existing they love this idea of having equ equality diversity the eye that they love it but my question for you is where do you think that cognitive dissonance happens for them who love to have everybody in their intersectional ideology of everybody being equal but when i walk in and i want to speak up and i want to talk about my oppression and my trauma and my experiences i get silenced instantly by those people and i get erased from the equation I don't know how to fight that because they are big. They have the yeah. voice. They have the power. I watched the same interview that Yasmin watched. And for me, that had a silencing effect for about a decade because I thought, if Sam Harris gets silenced, what chance do I have as a new immigrant to this country? I have no power. I cannot speak up. So for me, the question is, where does that cognitive dissonance happen? in a liberal person's mind, in, in a progressive person's mind, that I do not exist as a person and I should not speak up about my experiences and I should get silenced and erased. I hope that's specific yeah. enough. Well, I mean, I, let me just admit that I'm as confused about it as you are because it's it's crystal, the, the kind of the moral terrain is crystal clear to me and I, I, I don't understand how people don't see it. Right. But but I, I just I, I just see the evidence of they're not seeing it. And and. Um, yeah, I mean, it just I you know, the, the, the there's some generic problems here that just have to be pointed out again and again, like, you know, the, the double standards. Right. I mean, just the. Um, you know, I mean, at one point I was at, I was at a conference and a, a, a woman academic who, you know, enjoyed all of the freedoms of the West and you know, had actually, uh, you know, a, a PhD and, you know, was just a celebrated academic. She was criticizing me for my criticism of the Taliban and my, the, you know, the treatment of, of women and girls under the Taliban. And, um, you know, she was treating me like a bigot for what I had said about, you know, the, the, uh, how, how evil it was to force half the population to live in cloth bags and to beat them or kill them if they try to get out you know, a line that goes over like a lead balloon with every liberal audience. Um, and I said, well, okay, well, just then tell me, how would you, how would you feel about me as a parent if I said that, you know, I've got two girls and, um, you know, rather than, you know, find some internship for them at NPR or at Harvard or whatever, you know, you, you know, uh, what I was going to do is this summer, I'm going to send them to go live in Afghanistan with the Taliban and, you know, they can get beaten with, you know, lengths of steel cable whenever they try to get out of their their burkas um, uh, or see the light of day. And they run the risk of having battery acid thrown in their face if they if they show an aptitude for reading. Um, am I a good parent or a bad parent if I decide that that's what I should do with my girls? And it just and it was obvious to both of us that she didn't have anything intelligent to say that could keep that they could that to you know that wouldn't shake up the rest of what she thought about uh, the um the social justice imperative here of of treating any criticism of this ancient culture as a you know, a a symptom of colonialist you know white supremacist bigotry right so i you know it's just Again, you have to pick your moments. You know, you're going to have whatever arguments you're going to have. Uh, but I mean, I, I I can just say that you and and Yaz and and um, you know anyone who's who has a 
uh, superficially, you know, the, 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 the right tribal identity to cut through the identity, the, the first filter of identity politics, you do have an advantage. I mean, I know it might not seem like you have an advantage and you do run the risk of being pulled into the orbit of the right wing because you're like, if, if you know, if, if you go solicit, you know, interviews for various media properties, you'll find that only right of center uh, journalists and and uh, television shows will want to talk to you. I mean, there are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, it's going to be the Fox News uh, of the world that will want to you know put you on camera and not the CNNs. Um, and that's a problem. And, and, you, and we just need to we need to spell that out, you know. And so, when given the chance, I, I just think so. I mean, for instance, I take my recent conversation with Rory Stewart on my own podcast um there 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 I mean there are many ways that conversation could have gone better you know I, I, but um I mean what one of the ways I was hamstrung in that conversation is that I recognize that when I'm when it's my podcast I have a role as a host in addition to being a you know one of the the debating partners um and I do have to err on the side of being a gracious host more than I than I used to because I mean I've I've had podcasts run completely off the rails when I just decided I was just going to dig in and treat this person with the contempt that the that that they actually deserved in the moment. Um, so so there's that, but I just think there's there is something that you you know every everyone who is a you know was you know born to to in one of the relevant countries or to parents who you know emigrated from one of the relevant countries and who um you know can cut through the the identity politics canard um you do have a kind of superpower in those conversations. And, you know, if, if Yaz had been, you know, the, the thing I need to engineer are collisions between people like Rory Stewart and people like Yaz, because there are moves that he, you know, he didn't do, he didn't make too many moves like this, but they're just, it's, it, it was, it was humming in the background all the while. Um, he, he, you know, people like him need more collisions with ex-Muslims. It's just I, I mean I said as much in the conversation, and it's just because he of what his so much of his worldview was being informed by all of his happy engagements with believing Muslims, mm -hmm. right? He had met you know some hundreds of Muslims in his life, and even though you know his his confusion and and the discordance of his worldview was leaking out in other moments where he had to admit that oh, yeah some of those Muslims actually did believe appalling things analogous to what Nazis believe. Um, and so really, maybe they probably weren't my friends, uh, but the, the, in general, he has this self, self-selecting group of Muslims in his life, you know, probably by the hundreds, given his life experience, you know, all of whom were friendly and, and welcoming and proved to be great hosts when he wandered into a, a, an Afghan village and, you know, they g gave him food and protection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so he came away with the feeling that Islam is this perfectly benign, uh, religion. Um, as though he had successfully polled, uh, you know, a dozen Muslim societies by by meeting all the people who would be happy to meet him. Um, he needs to hear from people who have even more experience of living in the Muslim community and encountering its intolerance, right? And and people who can't be immediately denigrated as another white guy or gal who's suffering from Islamophobia, right? Uh, it's the Islamophobia canard that needs to be uh, deflated. And again, you know, ex-Muslims have a, a kind of superpower there. And, you know, you guys should use it. Uh, we, we, um, and again, I, whatever I can do to help you use it, I, I will, uh, I will try, you know. Please keep talking. Please keep yeah. speaking up. That's all I wanted to say because they silence us and I get called Islamophobic at least three times a day, at mm -hmm. least. Among this yeah. is one of the best things I get called every day. So please speak up because you speaking up and Yaz speaking up gives us the courage. It's just yeah. a silencing tactic. Yeah, yeah. No Thank doubt. you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.
Well, Sarah, as you have said many times, and I've said as well, it is a very rational fear um, in our case and in the case of many. So it's, a, it's an absolute nonsense. Um, last but not least, the very last question of tonight, Sani Yukta. Hi. <laughs> yep. Hey, hey, yes, come in. Hey, hey, Sam. Uh, it's amazing that I can talk to you guys right now. But okay, I'm really going to try and keep it short. But, um, so the question about, you know, uh, what can we do with this? What can we do about the request that's left, which seems like all of the left at this point? I don't know. I mean, I would say I am left, but um, I'm in India and um, I see Hindus um, defend Muslims. A lot more than Muslims do that. And I'm and, and, and Bengal, 40% of the state, um, it's Muslims. And this is like, I see this everywhere, and everyone is noticing that no one's really talking about it. Um, that's what it feels like. Um, and then there are those extreme people who are just, you know, disgusting, but it's, it feels like the same Sorry, thing. Sorry, Sunny, can I ask you to write mm -hmm. your question? It's very difficult to hear you. Oh, um, oh okay, yeah, I want my question. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, ahead. it wasn't a question, it was more like a suggestion. Uh, not what I mean. Something that I think could solve this, or like start solving the whole problem about, um, you know, uh, the social media and everything, the misinformation, um, the left being like this. So maybe I can text you later. <laughs> Something that'll be fine. But I do want like uh, to get it to Sam as well. If that's okay, it'll be really long. Is that okay? I'm not sure I got that. Is it? Is it? Uh, you got a further thing you want to send me? That that is a question or a comment? Yeah. Um, it's not like uh, okay. I'm going to type it down. The sound. The sound is pretty garbled, unfortunately. But if you can send an email to Yaz, she can get it to me. If you if you have. Great question. Thank you, Sam. That's very generous yeah. of you. Okay. And thank you so much for giving us three hours of your time. I really yeah. appreciate it. I begged and pleaded for two, and then I stole a third one. But thank you so much. Um, everybody here has just been absolutely, you know, over the moon, grateful that you spent this much time with us. You're getting all sorts of accolades in the comments or in the, in the chat here that I'm sure you haven't had a chance to read mm -hmm. through. But thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. You, you yeah, are wonderful. Well, thank you. And I am grateful. Yeah, well, I'm I'm incredibly grateful for you, as uh, as you know, and um, yeah, just keep keep doing what you're doing. Yes, I mean, again, you're you're um, uh, truly indispensable. There, we need ten thousand of you, and we, you know, I can count on on one hand, and 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 uh, and still have many fingers left over. Uh, how many people I respect as much as I respect you in this space? So it's really. Um, just keep going, and it's nice to see that you've got a, a crew behind you that uh, is enjoying. They're all here for you. They don't. They yeah. don't show up like this every week. <laughs> well, it's, um, <laughs> don't stop. And uh, I forgot the specifics of, of of the blurb I wrote for your book, but it, I remember it did sort of encapsulate kind of the unique challenge that that you guys face. And uh, so I'm, you know, I just don't be discouraged by that challenge. I mean, eventually, the the world is going to wake up and realize that. Some people have been making sense for a very long time, and uh, they should have been listening, and, and you were certainly one of those people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. And nobody would have known my name if it weren't for your, um, you know, your <laughs> interaction, let's call it, with Ben Affleck, and that's what yep. inspired me to speak up. So you are the ripple effect um, that's, that's bringing good into this world, and you're the one that's bringing everybody here today. And and thank you. Thank you so much for everything you do. And um, yeah, you're wonderful. Nice. Well, until next time. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, you were right, Amir. Nice. <laughs> Bye, everyone. After hearing all that, you might be left wondering, what can I do? How can I help? Well, this is why I created a nonprofit called Free Hearts, Free Minds. We are the only organization dedicated exclusively to helping these free thinkers. We empower them with our programs and supportive communities, lifting them up so they can heal, speak out, 
and begin to make positive changes, not just in their own lives, but within the broader community around them. If this is a cause that resonates with you and you want to make a difference, one way to do that is by donating to Free Hearts, Free Minds. Because not enough people care about this cause, we need people like you to help fuel this change. You can donate via our website, freeheartfreeminds.com. Thank you. Every dollar you donate makes a difference.